responsible and appropriate for the benefit of the South Wire Local District at large. We commit individually as a council to the principles of integrity and respect and to upholding the vision and values we have adopted in our long-term plan strategic document in order to energize, unify, and enrich our district. Thank you, Councillor Jackson, for that. Uh, apologies. I have an apology from Councillor Fox, who is not well, and Councillor Pickery, who has work commitments. Do we have any other apologies? All right. Um, I move to accept the apologies. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, uh, Councillor Colenso. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those against, motion is carried. Uh, conflicts of interest. Are there any conflicts of interest to Uh, acknowledgements and tributes. Are there any acknowledgements or tributes? That's our last council meeting. No? Right, public participation. We have a number of public participants speaking for us today. Um, when the council is ready to hear from you, I'll invite you to come in, uh, come and join us at the table. There is a five minute limit for speaking and questions, which we will adhere to. Uh, Suzanne will, they, they will or dig the bell. Ding the bell at four minutes. So I do encourage you, if you have any uh, papers, uh, to, to speak to the papers, but allow time for questions. Uh, I'd like to welcome Kim Hayes, Donna Fenwick, and Diane Phelps from the Nawi Rate Residence, Cape Palace Residence and Rate Pays Association. <laughs> kilometres of coastline in the South Wairata, and we're an integral part of that. And you were all voted as South Wairata District Councillors, every single one of you. Not just Councillor Dixon, who gets hit over the head with the naughty stick, because these things, yes you do, <laughs> um, these, these things just don't seem to be even, we don't see anything that they're not, um, you know, this is the third summer we're going into this. We need your help. You know, we need your help. Our infrastructure does not cope with the tourism that we're getting out the coast. We're advertised from councils to lonely planet and everything in between. Come to the coast, enjoy it. And yet we do not have the infrastructure around it to cope with it. Um, that, I'll leave that there because there's some reading for you to be done on that. And I'll get on to our rubbish. We thank the council for what you put in place to cope with our tourism rubbish. And it's adequate. But it doesn't cope with the commercial rubbish that's generated there. It's generated from the campground, the caravans. We need your help there too, because under the resource management consent for those businesses, there must have been a waste management plan in place. So they can't bring their rubbish and put it in the rubbish that's there for the campground and the tourism that we have. Tim, over to you. Um, the drains and the sumps around Nawi have not been, the, 
these big issues there about cleaning them out. Um, silk traps are all full. We had a member of our committee do a walk around the other day and, and on the little map that he's hand drawn, <coughs> we do have an updated map for the two waterfalls that bring the water down. One of those big drains hasn't been hasn't been cleared out. We, we were told it would get done, but it hasn't. He's also found a lot of sumps that have actually been just about tar sealed over, and, and which means they've never been open for years. And he said they're full of metal everywhere. So we really need someone on council or something to, to meet up with Steve, the man that did it, or and, and actually walk through the township. And we need these things fixed because it's causing flooding on people's property. We are a little town. We, we're not, you've got Featherston, Martinborough, Greytown, and now we is not Tora or Tawai or White Rock. It is a little township. So you do have another little town. That, that's not the major town, but we've been more and more people are living there. Um, yeah, we really need help. And we want to be put on a maintenance schedule so that we know every couple of years it gets done. You know, so that we're not going to be ringing up Tim or ringing up the council and saying, please come and clear that drain or, or do this. We just want to be put on a maintenance schedule, really, for our town. Yeah. And a speed hump, please, through some kind of, if you could look at um, speed in the village, it's shocking. Especially with the domestic tourism that's happening now, people are just going oh, straight through and, you know, little children running across. So if you could maybe look at that, how we could get some 30k signs or a little speed hump or a couple of speed humps would be great. But yes, thank you for your time and everything else there is written and pretty self-explanatory. I will give the secretary um, an updated map that just shows the waterfalls and there's a slip too that needs and we have had over the past a really good relationship with yeah. the council. When you know the multi-million dollar business comes out of the coast with fishing and farming, and we put a lot as a as a community into our infrastructure ourselves. So we, a lot of volunteer work, lots. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank Unfortunately, you. we have time for questions. It's a shame. So no, that's as some so I make for you. It's all right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we now invite Lee Carson to, uh, to come to the panel for regarding um, and the public roads. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for seeing me. Um, this is going to be um, really quick. On the 28th of October, the Greytown Community Board received a submission through Council from the developer of Rapa Valley Moiki to name the private road. The preferred name related to Marston and the other two had no reasoning. The names were not accepted as they did not meet 4.3.3 of the council road naming policy being significant to a local area. Through a process directed by the community board, appropriate names were sought and the name Kofi Lane was submitted to council. This name was surprisingly rejected by the developer who demanded his names be resubmitted for reconsideration. The Greytown Community Board again declined the developer's names and resubmitted the name Kofi Lane to the council. As a road owner of Moiki, I strongly oppose the names submitted by the developer as they are an insult to the Moiki land and the generations of people who have worked that land and the names do not meet the road naming policy criteria. Through this process, I've been waiting two months for my record number and nearly one month has passed with no resolution on the road name in order to obtain a record number. At a high level, the following information should be noted in order for the road name to be resolved quickly. This paper is submitted to the Greytown Community Board on the 28th of October, stating that all road names supplied by the developer were consistent with the guideline criteria of the road naming policy, is factually incorrect. The developer did not meet 4.3.3 of the policy. In relation to the council's current road naming policy, the developer and council did not meet the section 4.2.1 relating to application of resource consent. Section 4.2.2 was also not met by the developer's submissions of names. In addition, 10 of the 11 lots have sold with new owners of the road. The developer is no longer the majority property owner, giving him little right to name the road. If anything, the new owner should be no credit for naming the road. Council did not meet section 4.2.3, checking names against the policy, as names, again, did not meet the policy criteria. 
There is absolutely nothing in this policy that gives the developer the right to negotiate, to oppose community board's decisions, demand names to be reconsidered, or override council policy or resolutions. And um, adding to this, this policy looks like it was to be reviewed in November 2019, making it a year overdue for review. The terms of reference for the community boards clearly state their powers and delegations regarding road naming as per local government act in accordance with the local with, in accordance with local sorry with council policy as per council resolution 3 June 2020. However, council's naming policy does not align with the above resolution as per section 4.2.4 and 4.2.5. While the resolution of three June stands, it must also align with the current policy, something councils should address with some urgency. I would also add that the terms of reference is not dated, stating its relevance and significance against the time and or review of terms of council resolution. This is the application for resource consent approved by council for the Moiki subdivision. There is no reference of any road names as per section 4.2.2. One or 4.2.2. In fact, there is no reference even to the developer as the application is in the wrong name. I'm bringing you this as there are clear inconsistencies to the naming of the private road of Rapid Valley in relation to the roading name policy. Section 4.2.4 and 4.2.5 states that the final decision to approve a road name shall remain in the discretion of council. To ensure the mana of Moiki land, the Moiki people and the Moiki iwi is preserved, I ask that the Council today support the Greytown Community Board to adopt Kofi Lane as the private road name to Rapid Valley. I also seek that the Council acknowledge that the developers' submissions did not meet the current Council policy as highlighted by the Greytown Community Board twice. Finally, I've also been asked by the Kershaw family who sold the developer their land to highlight that the developer had sat in their kitchen and discussed an opportunity for the Kershaw family to have an input into the road name. That was not honoured by the developer. The council also told Ms. Mrs Kershaw many weeks ago that the council had stuffed up through the resource consent process why we have this problem. And I will add Richard and Karen Kershaw will stand by those statements. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. We have uh, 19 seconds, but does anyone, anyone have a question for Lee? Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to welcome uh, Campbell Moon. Don't worry, we won't start to this season. <laughs> Good morning. At a public meeting called by SWC and the Anti Board of Bethesda on the 9th of November <coughs> this year, Alistair Cross, the consensus manager for GWRC, conceded that Greater Wellington Regional Council staff had granted consent to BJ Warren Earth Moving Limited, Boral Quarry, and Underhill Road, Featherston, without following the required protocols under the RMA. PJ Warren Earth Moving Limited have now applied to SWDC for consent to crash aggregate on the site. Following the November 9th meeting, a group was formed, Wirepa Future, to oppose this application. Representatives of various Featherston organisations and ratepayers have joined and are 100% opposed to granting this application. As the southern gateway to the wire wrapper, Ferguson would be the most disadvantaged town. The last five years have seen Featherston become a vibrant community filled with young families and professionals, attracted by the affordability of houses and proximity to Wellington. As Underhill Road leads off Wakefield Street, one of Featherston's main residential streets and thanks to State Highway 2, a constant flow of aggregated trucks exiting onto State Highway 2 would cause serious problems for traffic coming off the Rimataka Hill Road. 
Wire app tourism will be the biggest casualty as Underhill Road is a vital to the success of the Five Town Cycle and Walking Trail. Tyranny Cow Bridge cannot be accessed on the south side except from Underhill Road. Up in aggregate trucks up and down all day will make it unsafe for walking and cycling. Featherston is also the gateway for Moana Wetlands and Kartik Astronomical Observatory, built in 1867. It is the only one of seven left in the world, and this spring restored will be a major part of the Night Skies project. The decision for South Wairapa must be taken by the council. I would quote an email from the CEO on Monday to a member of our committee. Thank you for this email. The mayor has already declared his family's association. Also importantly, the decision making regarding this consent is done under delegation to officers and as such, has involved no influence or decision making by the elected members. The decision of South Wairapa Council must be taken by the council. This decision must be taken by government, not the executive, and don't necessarily by any means required to do so. As the councillors are the Answerable representatives of the ratepayers. <coughs> Finally, Wire the Future would suggest that SWDC collaborate with them in the new year 2021 on a request for a judicial review of the Greater Wellington Regional Council's methods used when they granted the consent for this quarry. This cannot happen or go ahead, either consent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ken. We'll uh, defer questions on this uh, to later on. Um, thank you, Rob. Uh, welcome, um, Sharon Garrett. Sharon, oh, there she is. Sorry, Mr. Mayor and Councillors, thank you for hearing me. Um, I'm also here today to voice my concern over the rock crashing and stockpiling activities outlined in the resource consent submitted by PJ Warren Earth Moving Limited um, for the site at Underhill Road in Featherston, not his diversion road property. Um, I've got three key areas of concern. One is local business, two is the socio-economic impacts, and the third is environmental issues. Um, I'll make this quite quick. The effect on local business um, directly affects me, and that's really why I'm here today. I have a hypnotherapy business operating from my property on 10 Algies Road, 47.8 metres from the border. I have photographs which will be supplied to Suzanne after the meeting of the lack of a shelter belt. I also have photos of shelter belts elsewhere in the region that is a proper shelter belt, so you can compare as a council and see what the difference is. There is no effort to mitigate dust or noise. And that will make it very hard for me in the sense of being a hypnotherapist, where I have to get someone into a state of relaxation, which is very similar to the feeling you have just before you fall asleep at night and just before you wake. It's a very, very deep state of relaxation, which will be impossible to achieve with the vibration, the sound, and the constant noise of a rock, rock crusher. It's just not going to work. Other businesses are affected. Some of those are honey, which affects Greytown honey, affects steams, affects my neighbour, Underhill honey. Um, others are cooking schools where foraging outdoors in nature is part of their delivery. Um, Mary Biggs, I think many people know the Biggses. Um, we also have lots of B&Bs for tourism. Investment by Greater Wellington Regional Council and the local environment on different product projects as well as the federal government seems to be in jeopardy if this rock crushing processing plant goes ahead. And I have got a handout to share. The socio-economic concerns for me are property values. 
My husband and I bought here because of a country lifestyle. We could have stayed in a place which afforded us huge salaries and um, a very different style of life. But we chose the Wairapa. He was brought up here in Greater. He was educated here at Rathkill, and we decided to come and return to the Wairapa for a country way of life, for a community sense of life, fresh air, bird life, native animals, and respect for the country that we live in, in a democratic country, as opposed to where I lived previously under a dictatorship. The value of our property, whilst no one in New Zealand or New Zealand statistics cannot give me figures at the moment about the proposed rock crushing, I have got research to prove that 20% initial devaluation of property prices. Featherston is the gateway to the Wairapa and the tourism and everything that we have that we enjoy in the Wairapa and all these wonderful projects like cycle trails, dark sky initiatives and so on and so forth are really going to be compromised. If all of a sudden property values drop, then property becomes affordable by the masses. And if we think back to 10 years ago, we will have meth labs again we'll end up with a very different demographic of the community. What we have established for Featherston and the Wairapa is prosperous. We have properties of good value. We have people who care about their community and the environment. And I feel that it, it would be remiss if we don't consider socioeconomic. The effect on tourism is immeasurable. Tourism pro provides jobs in the Wairapa and Mr Warren's application does not promise any jobs from the stock, um, the rock crushing or the stockpiling facility. If we compromise tourism from a socio-economic point of view, we compromise jobs and we compromise livelihoods for all of the Wairapa. In the absence of a geology study to confirm the composition of the rock, we cannot rule out silica. But the application is flawed. The application does not have proper sound studies for the site. It presents a sound study and noise study for Diversion Road, a very different site. It is not in a valley where there is an echo down the valley where we once used to hear the milk is swearing at his cows traveling down the valley. Now the rock crushing and the wonderful romance of clouds of dust will be there to haunt us. From an environmental Perspective, Act 6, 7 and 8 of the Resource Management Act have not been considered, in my opinion. I feel very strongly about the waterways and the national policy standard on waterways. I feel very strongly about the eels in our waterways and the habitats for those eels. Equally, the habitats for bird life. Do not think for one second that rock crushing dust will be contained to the site. It will cope with vegetation. I believe that there are two things for council. One, to deny the consent based on it being factually incorrect and the right studies not being presented with it. And two, South Wairapa District Council uses ratepayer money to repair a road. Why should other earmarked projects have the funds that were put towards them come to repair one road because one individual is going to reap millions of dollars in profit at the expense of people who live near this and are 3.8 kilometres away in Featherston who will have to have windows shut all summer because of dust, can't hang their laundry out and are losing the right in a democratic country to have a barbecue. I will provide the notes to Suzanne. Thank you. Uh, we uh, uh, invite Jennifer Ruff to lose Good morning and thank you for this opportunity. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Board of Trustees of St. Teresa's School, but more particularly on behalf of the children and young people in Featherston, because the impact of a quarry and a crushing plant will affect those young people. I also have three main points. We have all seen on TV the ads that say that our young people are at risk of obesity, of all sorts of diseases caused by that. So we encourage children to get out there and be active. Yet this plan that's been put before us allows for 12 truck and trailer loads a day. That's 24 trips up and down the roads past the card reserve, past the Featherston swimming pool, past the 
uh, Brown Bush Reserve, all places that are there to help our young children become fit and active in our society. We have young families moving into Featherston who want to be involved in the community. There's a group currently wanting to start a touch rugby tournament at the Card Reserve. This project puts all sorts of activities like that at risk. The second one is the dust. This crushing plant is within four kilometres of our school. We know about the wind in Featherston. We know that at this time of the year, the prevailing wind is a northwesterly, and the potential for that dust to come and affect our school, our students, our staff is of huge concern. It's already difficult to recruit teachers in Afghanistan. If you add a health risk, then we're facing the potential of not being able to staff our schools. Why would they come if they can get a good job somewhere else? And without good teachers, there goes the future of the children in our school. And every one of the three schools in Featherston, the three primary schools, has a growing and increasing number of students in them. The town is certainly growing. Think about the students with asthma and the potential for those students to end up with more severe health problems. But most of all, I want to voice our students' concern about the Donald Creek project. This is a student-led project that has been underway for four years. Through this project, the students have developed the skill and the understanding that's involved in scientific work. They know about fear testing. They know about environmental effects on the streams. And for many students, this results in the desire to make a difference in their own community. Already, we test the water in the Donald Creek and send our results to NIWA. We monitor the life cycle of the invertebrates and the other creatures in the creek. Recently, there was a metre long eel in the Donald Creek, just off State Highway 53. All of our students got to touch it, to feel it, to see that. There's also Inanga, the bait, and they are endangered. They are in the Donald Creek. There are Kura, we don't say that very loudly because we don't want them to disappear into somebody's pot, but there are Kura in that creek. They are very nice, I agree. <laughs> Your council has supported this project. The Featherston Community Board have supported this project. Greater Wellington Regional Council support the project. In fact, our students gave up their time after school two weeks ago <coughs> to a busload of councillors from Greater Wellington. Yet the project puts this project at risk. Dust in the stream? possible discharge into that stream. Taking water to dampen down the crushing plant means that the stream ceases to exist. It also ruins the habitat for these creatures. And from my point of view, it puts at risk the health and safety of our students who would no longer be allowed, be permitted to work there. So my question really is, why? Why would you slide a quarry and a crushing plant upstream? from a town and a school. So when you consider this, please think health and safety, children, young people. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Jennifer. We have five minutes. <coughs> we now welcome uh, Shane Atkinson representing the Great Town Meetings. Kia ora tātaha katoa, um, I acknowledge the Mayor, the Councillors and the Officers of the, uh, of the District Council and uh, I'm here on behalf of the Great Town Men's Shed uh, to speak just about the development which Adam Blackwell is proposing in Great Town and uh, you will have seen the front page of all the papers, um, wonderful pictures of developments, all the juicy advertising phrases, what your role from the mouth of uh, 
advertising people, 50 jobs, 50 million dollars spent uh, in flights of high value tourism and what have you. Um, and let me be very clear, the men should applaud the courage and the vision that a black woman's proposed commercial development. We don't oppose it, we think it's absolutely wonderful. Um, but I'd just like to emphasize, and obviously the men's shed members have concerns. Part of the proposed development is across land, which uh, men's shed occupies on license uh, from the South Africa District Council. Now, current license comes to about 2032. Uh, we occupied and developed the site with, average, with active support and encouragement from the region, from the District Council. Uh, and that support included issuing a building consent for our new financial building in 2017. And just by way of putting a number up in the air, the replacement value of the buildings and improvements uh, that the men should occupy is about $200,000. So, just our view. The relocation of the men's shed to a possible remote site will destroy the social <coughs> utility. Um, all three South Warrington men's sheds are located by design in the middle of each town to integrate them with the local community. Um, the greater men's shed offers its members, who are men, women, and children, visible integration, interaction, and a sense of purpose within our community. It also provides useful services for our local communities, such as the benches and the local public library and its potential civil defence base. The existing buildings are also used by other groups, such as uh, U3A. It's not just a back shed with a few old boats back around together. Um, when the proposal for the Black and Development reaches the council, we urge the council to remember that there's already a park just down West Street. And the proposal is that the men should be displaced and replaced by um, a, a, park, a, a park or garden-like area, uh, not, not by buildings. Um, we'd like the council to also remember that the men should can continue or accelerate our planting and beautification of the existing site, if that's an issue for the developer, um, and that the men should needs to remain where it is if it's to survive and provides current community benefits. Um, I'd also add that the statement from the developer that they need all the land or they'll move to Christchurch or Cambridge, you need to take that with a uh, pinch of salt. Um, and finally, this is a classic, or on the face of a classic conflict, conflict for Main Street retail and local community uh, users. It doesn't necessarily need to be resolved totally in favor of one or the other. We don't necessarily actually need all the space that we currently occupy. We have, we're given um, a lavish amount of space, and as you do, you sprawl all across it. We can certainly crunch up a lot without moving permanent buildings. It's not a conflict either we have Adam Blackwell or we have the men's shed. There's very rarely both can be accommodated on the same site. Uh, if Adam doesn't like the appearance of our Gypsy, gypsy and Catholic we can uh, certainly do some plantings to, uh, to shelter it. Um, and if the, his customers need somewhere to exercise, um, their space just down the street. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you. Thank you very much to our presenters. Um, we'll now move on to A5 actions from public participation. And we'll start with uh, actions for the, uh, discuss the Cape Palace rate as um, uh, presentation. Uh, before they start, have you, have you got any comments? Um, no, I don't think they're, they're valid concerns. We, we really do want to work with the rate players association. I think it's appropriate. Um, that submission should be considered by the Assets and Services Committee um, because it's, it, it, um, the nature of the submission was about a long term relationship um, and investment and a maintenance schedule appropriate for the Assets and Services to then uh, make sure that the part of the long term plan actually builds in some of those types of concerns. Um, the only comment on speed um, is that um, we've been waiting for. A district-wide review on speed management, triggered by the um, ZTA um, doing the speed management 
brand around around them, say, around them say Highway Two. So we'd obviously pick that up, but they're all part of the um, long term plan work. Um, but of course, we need to start some of that stuff sooner rather than later. Thanks for that, Harry. That was going to be my suggestion. We refer this to the assets and services, put it onto their action plan, but also with the view that a lot of it can be offered into the LTP. Uh, I, I, there are issues out there facing um, the residents now for this upcoming season because the anticipation is that we're going to get a lot of uh, local visitors. Uh, <laughs> And um, I just think that I could talk to you and, and Bryce on those matters just for this coming season, but definitely get it into the assets. Cool. Um, any other questions? Um, one I had, there was a comment that we hadn't spent any money from the tour, tourism infrastructure fund, but I think we had. Um, we did on um, some toilets. Toilets, toilets yeah. Um, <coughs> And there was um, some work around the culvert. Um, I don't know, I still have the detail, I have to find that one out. Yeah, yeah, I think we just need to dig a little bit deeper on that and give them the answer. So yeah, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think, you know, it's been highlighted and good on them for coming. Yeah. So the whole council can hear the issues out there, but, you know, it's ongoing. You know, the Jewish numbers are increasing dramatically. Yeah. And I think it's um, that we want to give both the residents and the tourists the best experience that they can have for living near or visiting. As the presenter said, that, you know, now we great players have actually have contributed funds to some of the uh, improvements out there. And they, <clears throat> it's all about relationships and they're keen to do that again. Yeah, we got a lot of funds, but we think some of the times it appeared to help. And of course, council will be aware that uh, they have the presentation and assess the services about the e-carry. Yeah. We're, we're trying quite innovative in different ways of trying to think of some of the impacts on the particular council's done on some of those roads. Yes. It's, but it's very difficult to follow there. Yeah. Right. So an action item to refer the concerns through to the assets and services committee. Yeah. Which I think is worth saying. All right, we next have um, discuss uh, Lee Carson's um, uh, presentation regarding um, public roads. Do you have any um, comments? Yeah. Um, I think that um, there was there was certainly one one pretty major point, and that's that the review was due on the twenty seventh of the eleventh, and I think realistically that this is that this is showing that there are some areas that would probably definitely need to be looking at to get that review done as soon as possible yep. uh, it might be more appropriate to bring it up uh, when we look at the minutes of the community board because it was quite specific in there that the authority was delegated to the chair and to simone uh, to come up with an answer that answer was come up uh, and as far as the community board were concerned that was a done deal mm. um, to have it, to have it, to have it re, you know relitigated by the developer. I'm not sure whether the developer has the right to do that. So, um, um, so we just comment. So um, Karen's um, not going the, the issue and, and uh, Lee raised the great issues. The interpretation of that section talks about um, the name must have a significance. Um, and so um, uh, Karen is doing a report to the community boards, um, which will be tabled in the next community board, so we can uh, make a have a, make an important decision. Oh, I reject that. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Please, please, please. Your time, your time for your presentation. We are now considering. The report won't make any difference. Lee, I'm sorry. So please do the right can thing. I just, can I just follow on from that? Um, this came up last meeting at council. It went to the community board. Um, I completely understand Lee's frustration because there are people on this road who don't have um, the ability for. Um, ambulances to go to their house. They're not getting their mail. We can't wait for another um, six weeks till our when's our next community board meeting end. Uh, okay, so we need to do this quickly, not slowly. I understand the bureaucracy here, but this has gone on and on and on. These people down this road are not getting the services that they absolutely need. Um, so if we could get that report done, 
straight away and we have an extra um, an extra meeting for the community board to resolve it. I'm quite comfortable with that, but we can't wait for the... Yeah. Well, we can ask the question of Harry is this able to, you know, as, as quickly as the council is able to resolve the issue, there is. Uh, so if you can possibly keep councillors informed on how we go on that. That's right. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Any other questions or comments? Right, we now move on to um, uh, presentations from um, Campbell, uh, Sharon, and Jennifer, and, and, and we thank them for their presentations. Um, however, as there is an active resource consent application being processed by council officers under the Resource Management Act for Riverstone crushing at the quarry on Underhill Road, Feniston. It is not appropriate that council make any actions for officers as this is an entirely an operational matter with officers exercising delegated powers under the RMA. Officers must follow the RMA application process as set out in legislation and prescribed by the operative district plan to determine the potential effects of the proposed of the proposal and decide whether the application will be publicly notified, limited notified or non-notified. We cannot preempt a decision that due to the considerable public interest, officers have held a meeting at Featherston to explain the consent process and will keep the public informed of the status of the application. So as councillors, we cannot interfere in that process. Um, with regards to actions from um, the Great Hounds Men's Shed, we thank Shane for his presentation. But the Men's Shed presentation is similar to the quarry presentation. We're in an early stage of our process for considering the future use of Great Hound land. Our decision-making process must be robust and transparent and elected members must not be put in a position that risks any perception of predetermination or bias. We will consult with stakeholders, including the men's shed and the community as necessary and in accordance with the law and our policies. That way we can ensure that all those affected by a decision will be given the opportunity to have their say and decision makers will be able to make a decision based on that. Excuse me, Mr. Lee, could I just ask a question not about the consent that is in front of Council now, but about the resource consent from Greater Wellington Regional Council. Can we, can we have a talk about that? Um, I uh, won't have difficulty discussing a uh, consent by another party if they're not present to answer the questions on their behalf. Okay, so I'm not asking a question about why it was given. Uh, one of our presenters said that in a public forum, the officer from Greater Wellington Regional Council stated that they did not follow the process. Is that not applicable then for us to say, well, as a council, we're not happy with that. We want a judicial review because you have acknowledged that you didn't follow due process. Again, I think um, that question has to be put to Greater Wellington Regional Council to rebut or not. So, okay. Can we officially uh, do that from our council? Reporting what someone has said <coughs> to a council and acting on that without context. I think, again, if there's a question of Greater Wellington Regional Council, we should ask. Okay. ask. Can, we, can we have it at an action point that we will go back to the Regional Council and, yes, and ask that very question? Yeah, clarify. Uh, I mean, yeah, we, that, hmm. that, okay, we will action point distribute that I know that certain correspondence has already been undertaken in that area, so the outcome of that will be. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask on the application to South Wairata what the timeline is going to be on that? Um, we can know. So the time, the timeline. Um, so we have a statutory um, requirement to process a consent with um, discretionary consent within twenty working days. Um, so it depends on the quality of the application. If there is absent um, information that is absent from the application, um, then we stop the clock and we go back and ask the applicant to provide. Um, that information, we have done that. There is um, there's information uh, that we need um, to be able to consider. Um, so we've, um, we've gone back to the applicant, but essentially it's a 20 day statutory requirement in terms of the consent, um, consent process. 
So are we, my point being, are we going to have action before Christmas? We, we can't state that because we don't know what, we, what uh, information is. is uh, the timeline of any information about being received the clarification. So we can't say that. Well, and the main, the main thing, the, the other critical decision is the, um, the, the officer's decision to whether to notify or not notify. And that has quite strict statutory tests about how that is applied. Um, and so if there's a decision to notify, um, then that would require appointment of a, um, a, a hearings panel. Um, and then the application would be heard by the panel um, and a decision made. Um, that if, it, if it was a hearing, it was very likely it was not a hearing for Christmas. Harry, can I just ask a question of timing? And I know you're frustrated with this, I was like, I can see it in you. <laughs> um, but if, um, so the process for a judicial review is any effective party can ask for a judicial review, correct? So if a member of the public said, my business is affected, they could ask for a judicial review, right? If that happens, would that affect the consent that is, would it stop the, would it put a hold on until that judicial review is done for the consent that's in front of us? Um, no, a judicial review doesn't in of itself do that. But then again, if the judicial review is upheld, then the consent for custody so becomes traditionally, So traditionally, judicial reviews, um, and I've been, um, I've initiated judicial reviews before. Um, so uh, the, the, what the, um, a judge will do is look at the relevant information um, that the authority must take into consideration, um, disregard any irrelevant information. Um, it looks at then the decision that is reached based on the relevant information. If it considers that, if the judge considers that um, the matter has been um, based on irrelevant information or there is information that should have been taken into consideration but wasn't, it would refer it back to the decision maker um, to, um, to consider this information. It's very unlikely in a judicial review that a judge would substitute a decision from another party. So it's not it's not a court of next appeal, which is so. If there are parties, because the RMA very specifically has appeal provisions, so um, there is a um, any party um, can appeal to the Environment Court GWRC's decision. Um, if they are parties to the proposal, they can appeal, basically. So there's, there's, there's two ways to go. Just a really quick question. Um, something that, that, that keeps cropping up as well is um, with regards to the four well-beings, and I'm just wondering um, uh, any of those within that RMA process as well for or where, or where it's sitting <coughs> And that consent, so you know, we're we're we're, cons we're needing to consider the four well beings. And I'm looking at this, and it's environmental, it's waters, it's you know, it's a, it's it's social. Um, so, so I'm just I'm just wondering if all of those things are things that through the consent process are looked at. Uh, no. no, no, no. The RMA is very specific. Um, so it, it, it has um, a number of statutory tests that must be applied. So it has to identify, um, and they're largely biophysical, um, and they have to be material, not fanciful. Um, and so there's case law, very clear case law about what can and cannot be considered as an effect from an activity. And it relates essentially to the rules in the district plan. Um, so the, um, basic, basically the material effects of acquiring activity, uh, dust, noise, uh, traffic movement, um, from a land use perspective, from a Greater Wellington Council uh, perspective, tends to be water, air quality, um, and those types of dimensions. So in this context, Greater Wellington Council have considered and granted an application. Um, so we are looking at the land use component of that. So uh, Harry, you're basically saying the best process to go through next is to appeal the RMA decision. No, 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 I'm saying, I'm saying, um, so that the effects that, that, um, that this council has to consider, as opposed to Greater Wellington yeah. Regional Council, are uh, the effects 
relating to crushing and yeah. um, crushing and uh, processing. So this is uh, the the activity of extracting gravel has already been consented by the regional council. Yeah. That is not our consent to consider. Uh, that's right, mate. Yep, I'll go to that. And there is a complication um, in the RMA that creates a thing called a permitted baseline. Yep. So the tests, um, if, if there's a current consent and it sets a threshold, then we've got to look at it as though those, those activities are there. You're not starting from here. It's called a permitted baseline. Yes, you think about that baseline, you would have learned that the last day or two. I'm not sure quite reading this for the next Harry, would the consent with SWDC take into effect um, impacts on health with the dust and the wind and yes. so on? Yes. So that would be a big component in yes. existing yes. underlying that's And that's the information um, that um, you would go to an applicant to make sure that they have provided information about um, what they are, um, what the dust footprint of your life would be, what the wind velocity, all, and that's all the kind of technical information. So it's dust, noise, traffic movement, and we require the applicant um, to provide information that we're not sure that that has been thorough, we get it peer reviewed. Um, but yeah, just not, this is the normal RMA process. Mm -hmm. Great, all good. Mm, thank you. Yes. We'll now move on to item A6, which is the Community Board and Modern Standard Committee for some meetings. I don't have the chairs here. The chairs for the Community Board. We've got, yeah, thank you very much. Would you like to um, come forward and give us a report back from your meeting? Uh, Actually, I'm only going to be speaking on one issue, we've got probably gas for that issue is. Um, at our um, community board meeting, um, the issue was raised um, under 9.5, the name of the new road to be a bit more cheap. Yes. Now, we looked at this in some detail. Um, the delegation to name roads under section 319A of the LGA, and in accordance with council policy, was given to the community board through incorporation into the community board terms of reference. The terms of reference were adopted by council on the 3rd of June. So we looked um, at the uh, uh, issue that was brought forward um, in terms of the naming of the new road at Moiki. Uh, the developer put forward um, three names for consideration. Archer's Way, which was the name that he wanted, and then Oliver's Way and Hunter's Way. Archer's Way uh, relate to the superintendent of Masterton Hospital, um, and therefore has no local significance. Um, the name Oliver's Way and Hunter's Way refers to the names of the two children, and again, has no local significance. Under 4.3.3, the name should have significant local content and meaning. And for that reason, we decided not to accept the names that were put forward. Now, it was discussed at the community board meeting, and it was decided because um, the issue uh, related to uh, 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 the name of the road, uh, the possibility of, of uh, ambulances getting through, Mail getting through if it needed to be done. So the decision was made um, that the, the naming of the new road be given to the subcommittee, and that was decided by the full uh, community board. The subcommittee members were myself and Simon Baker. We then approached the residents of Mohai, and there was a lot of discussion by those residents about the most appropriate name to put. That name is Profile Lane, and that is why we put forward that name. Now, apart from anything else, we have a legal right to do that. Uh, we've had a lot of consultation with the residents of Mokai, many of those are Maori who have lived in that area for generations and who are very concerned about uh, the outcome of this name. 
Um, so I would ask you please that it is not an issue to be taken lightly because it will affect um, our future uh, 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 interaction with the residents of Mokai. Um, and we are trying to build a rapport uh, with Mari and the residents of Mokai is probably um, one issue coming forward where we can make the right decision. The right decision um, has been made, it is coast by name, um, and therefore I see no reason why the council cannot go ahead and accept that. Excellent. We haven't got a report on the community board minutes, so if we just, mm -hmm. we got that quite. Right. Yeah, thank you very much. That's perfect. Thank you. Are there any other um, anything else you have to report back? <coughs> Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, right, day seven, extraordinary business. Do we have any other extraordinary business? Uh, does the other committee recommendation? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Councillor Mayor, we are. Uh, so, sorry, I was just. Oh, are we up to the yeah, up to A8, the minutes for consultation? Okay. Yeah, sorry, wrong place. So we're now considering the minutes from the 14th of October. So are there any corrections required? Oh, no? Um, no. Just with regards to the um, planning regulatory meeting. At that meeting, I wanted to know that the mayor's cabinet. We're not going to do that. No, just the council meeting for the 14th to around 88. So, how is that? Oh, yeah. So, that comes out of the AAB1. Yeah. We'll move that. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll check The minutes of the council meeting held on the 14th of October 2020 are true and accurate record. Seconded by council. So, all those in favor, please say aye. All those against, motion is carried. So, uh, do you have any comments on those men? Not so much, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's coming up. No? Yes. Okay, uh, do we have a move at the minutes of the council meeting held on the 28th of October 2020, our Eritrean and record? We move Councillor Hay again, seconded. Any seconders? Oh, no. okay. Councillor Hay, so, all those in favour, please say aye. All those against, the motion is uh, item I A9, uh, notices of motion. There are no notices. So now we move on to uh, Brenda One. Minutes of the Council Committees and Community Board. <laughs> yes, uh, so we now are uh, considering Report D1, which are the minutes of Community Boards and Committees. Do we have a movement to receive the minutes of the Council Committees and Community Boards? Thank you, Councillor Wears, second, and Councillor Enzo. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, the motion doesn't count. Councillors? Um, with regards <coughs> to the Mary Standing Committee um, minutes, I emailed through to Narita asking her about the word reserva and it should be in reservoir. Oh, right. So I've asked her to correct that. That's with regards to the reservoir. Yeah. Uh, this so we received oh, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, they're not correcting. <laughs> Any other comments regarding? No. Nope. Right. We'll now receive all the minutes in one motion, and I'll take it as read. Do we have a mover uh, to receive the minutes at, uh, itemized in point two down to point eight? Move Councillor Plymouth, second of Councillor Ems. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> against. Motion is carried. And we've got the B2 recommendations for the planning and regulatory committee. Uh, do we have a mover to receive the report? Yeah, thank you, various Councillor Maynard, seconded. Thank you, Councillor West. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against. The motion is carried. Uh, unfortunately, Councillor McLean is not here. But if we have anyone who attended that wanted to add anything to the report? Um, I did want to note that um, at that meeting I did mention the fact that the um, regards to the Feathers from Quarry Resource Consent Branch by Greater Wellington Regional Council, that there is a condition of there of no crushing to be done on the line. The motion has been, uh, the data has been made of that and the CEO will get back to you with that clarification. Uh, final. Yeah. Oh, sorry, um, I was 
Are we going to ask, can we ask questions of the various reports that have been sent to you? Uh, as long as, please bear in mind my comments regarding um, uh, some of the submissions. Yeah, no, no, this is, I was just asking, going to ask um, the Chair of the Finance Committee um, about um, uh, where was it? Um, the insurance part, there was an insurance paragraph I've got in there. Oh, yes. Uh, could you just give us a bit more information on that? Um, so, we received um, the minutes and gone past the finance and order. Do you want to go back to? Yeah, no, we well, didn't give us a chance to ask if there were any questions. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so you went here, sorry. No, I was. Of course. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll go sorry. back to that and we'll allow a question. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yes, happy to answer that. Um, what would be. What we were looking at was um, how we might look at our insurance in the future. So it's coming up in 21, and it's, we had a presentation given to us on how we might look at risk a little differently. Um, as an example, we've had uh, minimal claims on cars over the years. So is it actually worthwhile to have full insurance on the cars when we've claimed actually nothing? So it's just uh, if there was an earthquake and you've got a building currently insured for let's say two million, if it was destroyed in an earthquake, would we choose to actually uh, completely replicate that building or would we choose to do something completely different, which might bring an insurance cost in a million? So it's really just to try and look at uh, different ways that we might look at risk going forward in the future and it just allows us some time to. It's not for review until July. I think we do our new insurance in July 1 next year, so it allowed us some time to look at this thing. Is there something in the Local Government Act about self insuring? Is, is, there, is there some sort of element, is there guidance about how much risk we have to insure against or what we have to insure? I don't think it's a policy decision. I don't think it's a policy decision. Yes, I'm trying to make on legislation. Is, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's the case. Yeah, that, we had the, 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 uh, very few claims on motor vehicles, but our, our premiums. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but certainly, I think insurance is a big one uh, to look at. So so it, it's balancing risk versus expenditure yeah. and yeah. Sort of cost. Damage. So if we'll go back to the planning and regulatory committee in the minutes. Um, is there anything else to add for those minutes? In which case there is a, um, a resolution. Uh, so we, do we have a mover for the recommendation shown as one or two that pursuant to the section 10A of the Dog Control Act 1996 and the Dog Control Policy Practices that 2019-20 be adopted and two that the officers be authorised to publicly notify the report. Moved, Councillor Clark, Secretary, Councillor Hay, all those in favour please say aye. Aye. All those against. The public, the public good is now satisfied. Uh, <laughs> B3 recommendations. We're now considering the report B2, the report from the, is it B2 or B3? B3. 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 Report from the Wairarapa Library Services Joint Committee. We have a move to receive the report. Councillor West, Seaman, Councillor Colenso. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Mr. Gates, the motion is carried. Uh, Councillor Colenso, would you like to walk us through the recommendation? Uh, yes. Um, currently, we have about 17 policies for um, the library, and our new Wire the Library Services Manager, Annette, has, um, has, has looked at those um, and, and um, looked at what other libraries have, what the National Library have, and um, and just and presented to the committee the fact that we could consolidate those, which would be easier from her perspective for working with, with library staff, with people trying to understand the policy when there's an issue and things like that. So um, it, um, it, oh, excuse me. <laughs> I turned it off. <laughs> And um, so uh, I think that this will make it much easier to understand, to work with, and 
and to come down to three policies. It's, it's a great idea. Thanks for the policies, yes. Mm. Yeah, Councillor West. Um, so I'm having a it's a really good question, quite thorough. But I'm just wondering if we could be included in that policy um, around the um, donations of cash. There's donations of books, but if someone one was to bequeath a cash donation to their library, it's not reflected in the policy. I'm just wondering if there's actually any thought given around that. The rules, wasn't it? No, 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 which is why I'm bringing it up. We can certainly take that back and, and the committee can, can have a look at that. It has never but happened. I would have, it might not happen, but there's nothing to stop it from happening in the future. It's going to be future proof, wasn't it? Yeah, good point. And I think, yeah. It could well be a bit. Or I remember oh, there was a request a few years ago that went uh, to the library in Greydown, but it came through the council. council. Yeah. I, I dare say that would be. There may be vehicles for that, but we'll have a look at that. Yeah, it might be a separate. Yeah, it might be a financing policy rather, yeah. Than, yeah. Uh, rather than actually the policy itself. But maybe reference to that, just yeah. to, to clarify yeah. that. I mean, align it with the CBC, I don't know, CBC. You know, they, they will work under this. This will go to Captain yeah, yeah. Council as well for, for acceptance. So, um, yep, we can certainly um, look at that and how we move that into the policy. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> the question we, we, we'll grab that because it's, um, we may be able to resolve that issue through the financing, but it may not require amendment to the actual policy yeah. before, mm -hmm. um, before we make any changes. Yeah. 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 And can, I think we'll, we'll continue this, but we'll come back as an actual report to come back to us yeah. with regard to yeah. yeah. what the yeah. process would be. Right. Cool. Thank you. Um, I've got one question as part of this, and it may be that something for the future, but have we considered the impact and benefits of having a no fine policy like some councils are doing? Um, was that discussed? We, oh, yeah, it was yeah. discussed. Um, we put that through um, the last LPP. Or the last end of the plan when we amended some of the, the um, charges. charges, and um, it was agreed that there would be no charges for um, children's use, books, but they felt that um, cool. the councils felt that the, um, adults should still pay for a certain Cool, as long as we consider it all options yeah. within that, that might be a recommendation through to the LTP. Yeah. It went through public consultation with regard to that and right. with the charges. And I must say that NX has been extremely <coughs> thorough in their experience in this whole sector. It's very, very apparent. I think they're very lucky to have been. Yeah. It's got a much more uh, customer focused space in how we manage our libraries. And, uh, and I think they're very positive. Good for our libraries. Cool. Um, I just like 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 having a quick perusal, and I just wanted to clarify with you, Pam, it, 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 because I what I noticed is in the original seventeen, and that is a lot, but um, but there are a few there that that are actually about the you know like the very first one, care of children and libraries policy, the school holiday program policy. It's that I'd still like to know that there was that actual. Um, you know, there, there is a policy there specifically for children, you know, and their and their safety, I guess. And I'm not quite sure where that fits in um, in the new in the new ones. So, you know, I wasn't really call development it. and management policy because it's a development of the children reading and what the libraries can provide in in, <laughs> in development of 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 their um, education and things like that. What so, are you on? Um, just, 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 just where you know out the the view, like in the you know, it would come and uh, <coughs> that's kind of one. Is it this children and young adults chapter uh, page fourteen? No, no, I no, went mean, on to fourteen. And that's actually what what what's up here. I just got, I, I, um, page 17. 
all these all these children in their metal. Yeah. So. That's under collections, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. That's under collection. I think that's wrong. You know, I, I just think that maybe that's it's, it's actually a really good thing to to so to perhaps just to maybe have a look at, at what the wording was in the previous one and still have something that catches that around it in there. Sure, there's all the holiday program and things like that. Yeah, it's just kind of sorry, it's much harder to go through on step. I should have highlighted those things for you. No, it was just a thought, but it's just because I know that, you know, like uh, looking at what the other 17 were and just, you know, like, like I think I think it'd be nice to know that there was a policy there for like care of children and libraries policy. <laughs> I, I like the sound of that. Doesn't that make any parent feel safe? I have a feeling that I would need to... Would need so, to there we go. It is. Them. It's on page five of nine in the second one. And it's care of children at WS... WLS libraries. What page is that on? Page five of page nine. Five. And it's in the... Um, is that on a stem? It's on the... Yeah. No, it's page five of nine of the... Of the oh, 17, you mean? No. Um, the library customer services policies. Customer service policies. Attachment three. Table of contents. And it talks about... Yeah. Oh, well, that's, on, on, on the... It's, hang on, where are we? Uh, on Stella, it's page... Page 65, 66. 65, 66. Yeah. Yeah. Care of children. Care of children. Um, yeah. Parents so and guardians or caregivers are ultimately responsible for the supervision and behaviour of their children who are 14 years old or less. Library staff will comply with the following legislations. Irene and Tamariki Act. In 1989, Children and Young People's Wellbeing yes. Act, Education Act, and the Children's Act. Um, and the library staff will intervene if a child or children's health and safety becomes an issue, including em emotional wellbeing, or there is a disruptive behaviour that is caused by or affects either the child or the children in question. So there's quite a bit in there. On page 27, they um, yeah. 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 and I would say that the, the um, holiday program that's just business as usual that any, any good librarian would run anyway. Uh, it's, still, it's still nice to have it, it's good to have it in there because actually, if it wasn't in there, they don't have to. I'd be wondering about their performance as a librarian if they didn't have those, <laughs> those <laughs> yeah. sorts of programs in yeah. anyway. <clears throat> so, yeah. um, I just, um, just add in there with regard to the holiday program, um, currently, Trust House provides the, I think it's Trust House, the, the provision for the funding to run the holiday program. Um, is being withdrawn so that we're not going to have that, that, that external funding to run that holiday program from next year. From next year, so we need to pop this into the old team. <coughs> so we need um, to... Um, well, not, ne not, necessary, not necessarily, because there's been um, some private companies, so there's a whole pizza promotion for book reading at the moment. For the kids, they read a book, they get a, they get a wagon wheel and they flip it off. <laughs> Some of the other ones that, are, that have occurred over time have been centrally funded. <laughs> often, um, well. So, are we yeah. happy that this reflects the 17 holiday program in the holiday program? Are we okay then to go through with? Um, 
which the recommendation is shown in one and two, um, and I'll take them as read because you've got them in front of you. Do we? Yeah. Do we have a move for the recommendation shown um, as one and two? Um, Move it. Okay, so Glenzo, second, Councillor A. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, the motion is carried. Do you prefer that or would you like me to read them out? Uh, that's that's why you said to do that. You start by listening to me. I get enough of it every day. But, but, so you want to read the whole okay. 68 pages? Right, so we finally get to the part where we have Kim, who's been spreading very patiently there on Zoom uh, with regards to the Wellington Regional Approach Bank. So we Welcome, uh, Kim Kelly. So we'll move, we'll move to uh, report C1. Before I open the floor to Kim, can I have a mover to receive the report? Thank you, Councillor Jepson, seconded. Councillor Maynard, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against, the motion is carried. Kim, can you give us a brief outline of what you're asking from us today, given that you gave us 250 pages to <laughs> 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 I only gave you 76. Your officers must have given you the rest. Um, with, with, with pictures. Um, essentially, the, the purpose of the meeting today is to endorse that 76-page um, document, um, which is the draft framework for public consultation, which will happen sometime in March or April next year. So you're the sixth council out of 10 to consider it. So um, all the other five, I just point out, have um, endorsed it. Um, yep, so today that's essentially the task in front of you. So I'm just here to answer any, if you've got any further questions. I mean, from my comment, I think it's um, a very good guide for us while we've been doing our spatial and, and long-term plan. I don't think uh, what it's indicated within the framework is onerous to the South Wider Upper. Uh, Councillor Maynard? Uh, no, I think that one of the things that really jumps out to me is that from the looks of things, Martinborough is still not going to be any additional public transport. Um, so is that because you're not seeing Martinborough in the, um, on the map? Yeah, but it's there. Yeah. But it's sitting there all by itself with no blue around it, so it's, um, um, with no link up to anywhere else. And that's kind of how we feel, you know, like we, we, we might get like one or two buses coming through a yeah. day. Right. I think if I could comment on that, this is merely uh, the regional framework which what changes might be required yeah. as a result. That's why I thought it's it's independent it. of what else other advocacy or in conversations we're having with uh, Metlink or the Greater Wellington Regional Council with regards to this. So it's not a, this is the status yeah. of everything. It's more the growth framework. Would that be fair to Paul Kim? Yeah, and, and I think, because um, just a, a couple of things, a reminder that the growth framework and that diagram is just highlighting the areas where the growth framework is going to focus, so we expect growth to happen in other areas. Um, and I think when I was um, there last at the workshop, we talked about Featherston. So I think, you know, as growth starts to happen in, in Featherston over time, that will naturally, I think, um, raise that question of public transport, you know, perhaps between those two areas, if not further. Yeah, but it's not meant to, not meant to solve all the public transport problems. Alistair. Um, yeah, Kim, thanks for this. Um, I read it again last night in detail, and I still have a real concern with it, that it doesn't give us in the Wairapa any guidance as to how you see growth in the Wairapa. You talk about growth from the Hutt Valley to Masterton. There is a significant barrier in there, and unless you can say there's going to be growth from Hutt Valley and then growth from Wairapa in the Wairapa region, we have nothing to say what our planning is going to be around this, because you talk about the numbers of 40,000 odd coming into that big area, but we need to be able to try and make decisions on things that occur on this side of the hill. Now, of that $40,000, you've given no indication of your thought process about how many of that $40,000 are going to be on this side of the hill. And for us, that's really critical. And I'm just saying it's just, and I read it through and I read it, and it just, to me, it is just another document that's come out of Wellington that treats us as part of Wellington without acknowledging there is a fundamental geographical barrier. So, <clears throat> so those numbers that are in the growth framework, 
they all come from um, GIS mapping that we did and then discussions with your staff and everyone else's staff to get to those figures. So, so um, <clears throat> like your planning staff have the figures that we used for South Wairapa and um, Carterton and for Masterton. And, and, I, and I've had meetings with them about how they take those figures and you, you, you use those um, for part of your spatial planning that you're doing. So those numbers do exist. We just don't, we just haven't published them in the growth framework by TA because you know, we really want to emphasize the fact that this is a regional document. So you could, you could fix, to me, you could fix this document with one line that says, of that 40,000, we anticipate X number from wire. That's, and that would make this a very useful document for oh, us. Of that at corridor. The moment, yeah, yeah. At the moment, it's just Wellington centric. So that one line will change it and give it relevance to us. Yeah, so you're talking about the Eastern Corridor. That's that's, yeah. that's easy to do, yeah. Because then we have something to plan on. Yeah, and, and I just reiterate that your staff have them as anyway. Oh, but it's, I'm, but sure, I will, I'm sure yeah. the figures are out there, but this is going out to consultation around the district. People will go, oh, again, that's, we're being lumped okay. together. Yeah, yeah that's, that's easy to do. Thank you. I think it's a great document, and uh, I think the thing that you've got to bear in mind this is a draft to go out for public consultation. And once we get that input, there's going to be input from the public that we can't see now. Oh, yes, but uh, from our area, they can't see themselves in this document. Yeah, so how no. many of them are <coughs> That's what I said, bearing yeah. one. That was yeah. Just, yeah, one yeah. line a few of them. So, you know, I, I expect that we're going to get, well, they're going to get a lot of feedback from us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, Kim, under 5.7, under the community infrastructure, which is on about page 63, it talks about parks, community centres, schools being essential to health, wellbeing and social prosperity, but it actually fails to mention the libraries. <laughs> well, yeah. that be, I think um, our CEO, Harry, has sent this through to you, but yeah. while it's an oversight, um, we, we actually think that libraries play a key role in social cohesion, education, connectedness, recreation, wellbeing, information provisioning. And these have a, a direct bearing on people looking for jobs, for doing skills, employability, health, that sort of thing, and overall happiness. Is there a chance that um, to have some of the work of the libraries included in um, a paragraph on that page. There's a little bit of a, a gap that you can fill with words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, Harry sent me that email, so I'd already made a note to make that change before the draft goes out for consultation. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure whether you can make a reference to the public library's handbook, which is literacy and life um, in there, which which also has bearing on, on what libraries provide over, over in New Zealand, this part of the world. And it's their strategic framework for the 2025 time frame. Okay. Yep, I'm just making notes. Thank you. Yep, can do that. Wonderful. Anyone else? Question? No. Oh, good. Otherwise, it's very interesting. Good yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, as Eric said, who else has been to some of the planning meetings over in Wellington when we've been doing the big group? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, really. But it's been fascinating. It's been absolutely fascinating. So if you get an opportunity, I'd go. <laughs> um, right, so with that, do we have a mover uh, for the five notes there? Since so that might be talking. Uh, two through five. Do we have to move? Will we accept items? Oh, Councillor Ayres, <laughs> seconded. Councillor West? Yes. Any motion in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against? No motion is carried. Thank you very much. <coughs> All right, good. thank you. Would you like to endorse that with the changes as um, discussed? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. To be put in there yeah. as well. yes. So, yes. would you like those endorsed or does that uh, uh, affect your? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, does that affect any of the motions from the other six councils with regard to the options? 
adding those two things in that you raised. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, that's fine because there's an ability to do minor wording changes. So oh, I'll, I'll do another one that uh, I was trying to move that we, uh, uh, in the above resolutions, we endorse the changes as, as discussed with uh, Councillor Jepson, Councillor Hayes, second in, all those in favour can say aye. Uh, all those against, the motion is carried. Cool. Thank you, Kim. You can get back to work. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. Oh, um, Item now C2, the Maori Standing Committee appointments. Uh, do we have a meeting to receive the report? Councillor. Colenso, seconded Councillor Plimmer. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those against, the motion is carried. Please note that it's not a dementia. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is quite a straightforward. <laughs> This is quite a straightforward report, unless the councillors um, have any questions. Uh, but initially, I'd also like to recognise and, and thank Terry Tamari for the work that he has uh, um, uh, done on, on the morning Standing committee and continues to do with Norma Rai. Uh, so he's been a very valuable member for the time I've been involved with it. Um, yeah. So do we have a mover to... <coughs> Uh, a resolve to make the following external appointment to the Maori Standing Committee, which is Suzanne Murphy from the Kahuna Marae. I'm very Kauhinui. pleased Kauhinui. with that. Yeah. Um, I've um, met Suzanne a couple of times, and boy, has she got some passion. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just what's needed is brilliant. Second. Second. Thank you, Councillor And could it? Could is there any way that if we do hold something, um, even like just a, a catch up, you know, for the end of yeah, 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 with, with our groups of Terry, although he has resigned because it is the end of the year pretty much, if he was still able to have an invitation to join us for a for a Christmas, it, whatever we may do. Certainly, but I think it also we should ask the Morning Standing Committee if they be having an end of year celebration, he comes along as well. Oh, yes. No, no, no. Well, yeah, that would, that would yeah. still happen, but I was just, Council. Could I ask that a letter of um, appreciation goes to Terry for, for the work from council and councillors um, for the work that he has done um, over the eight years he's been on Mary. If you're happy, I will do an action item with Mayor Wrights and Lisa on yep. behalf of the council and mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. uh, to agree for appreciation. Okay. What about one of those lovely certificates of appreciation? Oh, well, can you look into that, please? Yeah. That cost a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we want to get that right. <laughs> okay, all right. So you, you've had the, the motion. Um, and we've had a seconder. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against, the motion is carried. Mm -hmm. right, we're now going to see. Do you want to come to see? Yes, please. Yeah. 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 Um, well, just before we go, I'd like to introduce Brian, who's sitting at the back. If you come and join us in a cup of tea, Brian. Please. Brian and I have worked, um, God, 10 years, Brian? Yep. Yeah. Cool. So we'll um, come back in 15 minutes, have a quick cup of coffee and a Committees, do we have a move to receive the report? Councillor A. Second, Councillor Maynard, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 All those against, the motion is carried. So, this is an information report rather than a decision document. So, uh, how many, what, eight, would you like yeah, to just introduce it? Remember, we had the discussion in the context of um, um, trying to frame up the, uh, the frequency of council meetings. Um, and you know the, uh, what we want to try and do is encourage as much public participation into the subcommittees to give a, a much wider breadth of the opportunity for the 
public to participate with council rather than yep. um, the very small time that's allocated to the council meetings itself. So um, we have talked just to come back to you just to let you know what our thinking was around how we would uh, encourage and communicate um, to our um, public about the opportunity and, and what we would do. So we've got a, a report for you um, and if any questions in terms of content, um, you know, Amy's here to actually respond to any ideas or suggestions. Right. Um, so my um, query was around some of the wording um, and there is a part of me that says this is for um, SW, South Warrior, rate payers and interested stakeholders. Well, actually, it's not just for the rate payers that can come to these meetings, it's actually the whole of the South Warrior district, regardless of whether they pay rates or not. So I'm wondering if we can reword that. For some reason, like, um, the residents of yeah. the South Warrior district. Council and so, sorry, I used the word public very, very deliberately when I was introducing that because remember, it's not um, people who are um, outside of the uh, of the district still has as much right to be able to participate as they have an interest. So, so I, I use that word public quite deliberately. Um, sorry, the report didn't, didn't do that, but yeah, that is. Um, okay, I'm interested stakeholders by taking the Yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, goes around to um, describing our standing committee, access and service committee, planning and regulatory committee, um, financial audit risk. Um, they're great as titles, but they, but they, they sometimes mean nothing. It's kind of like, oh, I've got an issue about uh, my piece of land. Oh, which one does that put into this? That's it. It's a part of <laughs> um, maybe just a, a quick snippet of. What those areas cover? Is that yeah. Absolutely, that's what this comms plan um, intends to do is to identify what happens in these meetings. So we need to be able to board and plan some of the programs for these different meetings. Thank you. Um, I thought it was great, it's fantastic. Um, uh, so Palmerston North Council uh, have got a program at the moment that is starting called Demystifying Council. And uh, they're planning on holding a series of workshops with public. I tried to get some more information from them and I really followed up, but I just wondered whether there might be an opportunity to take an actual topic which is of importance to people and have almost like a, a debate. Or maybe you could use culinary college students or counselors, maybe you could split it so you have some on the team who are pro a particular position or anti and just get a feeling for the robust system I think it would be it would not would be a five minute exercise to set it up. I think it could be something that could be mm -hmm. useful. We need to avoid any RMA decisions. It could be uh, like a simple topic that I think it would be kind of Good if we did that regularly, that would actually open up what councils can and can't do uh, as well as a part of that. Um, but I think it, it could be as public quite interesting. And I think we also get around that five minute rule, which means it's quite restricted. It could be you do it out of the council chambers. I don't think we've got to talk through that, but um, I'll certainly follow up with council and we'll see what we can do. We can try and see how it goes. It's a place to place with the Yeah. Yeah. Have a fun, you know, fun, 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 I think it could be councils versus students. Councils just a lead us from the ring I've been thinking about for a while of supplied by a few with public consensus. I'm just wondering that, you know, if we allocate an amount of time at a council meeting or a um, committee meeting, so if there's only one or two presenting, that we can give them that extra time or give us the extra time to talk, ask questions. Yeah. Whether that's a better way of doing it. I mean, you'll find that generally, unless they're really stacked up, 
you know, there, there is a bit of leeway for those ones like just talking to the team to go over that, but you know, you need to stick with the rules when you get to three or four. Uh, so I think that's already there anyway. Um, gives you right. The standing orders allow us to vary that. Yeah. At, at and, and the chief other chairs. The, I mean, you take today with the three talking for the whole five minutes on the issue of feathers. Yeah. So, you know, and they will take the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I, do, yeah, I guess I, you I do more than you know, there, you know, if there are, you know, you've got to leave time for questions within that. You know, we have the information usually in front of us anyway. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, can see, I can see the point. I think it is taking. We're not topical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 so, 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 um, I think probably the, the fact that there's the YouTube videos there that where each of the committee chairs can actually explain what the role is of the committee, I think that's going to be a really, really vital. And um, the sooner that can get out so people understand what it is that each of those committees represent, so, so then, you know, your, your rate cards or your consent uh, community members can actually come and come into the right meeting and not, not then be pass it, told to... Um, go to the next one. So I think that that would be really good. I, I just um, wanted to touch on the um, the last point, which was the investigate potential for earned media. Yeah, so that, I was thinking that we don't want to throw a lot of advertising money at this, but mm. we might be able to find a news angle that would um, allow a reporter to um, get their story out there and get it out Okay. I think Marcus will be right into that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a minute, I'll lock the door. Okay. Thanks. Uh, how many of our rate payers have opted in to receive communications from us? Uh, um, I think that is so it could be we could use that to see the link to some of these. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, uh, the proposal is to include last year the rates in the newsletter, yeah. and that goes out to everyone. And to those people that we have emailed us before, if you email us, we'll send you that email. So I think at someone else's email address, someone in the community probably would. So, yeah. so that means it can actually be forwarded on and they can, you know, um, it's, it's a great way to kind of touch, touch base of them, right? more, more than just those two and a half. And you feature those little videos on all of the community for Facebook pages. Yeah, we'll publish them and share them across. Yeah, great idea. I think it's brilliant, it's there for me to start. It's, yeah, it's really good. Right, any other questions? <clears throat> so we now um, we have the three waters uh, D D one three waters for an update uh, RFI. So we have Brian Patchett. Uh, go on up. Uh, Brian's the project director for the regional water reform project. Uh, welcome, Brian. So we get started on the presentation. Can we have a mover to receive the report? Thank you very much. Seconded. Thank you, Councillor Jetson. All those matter of say aye. Aye. All those against, I should carry. So to you, Brian and you. Um, before I go, pass over to, to Brian, we'll talk through the slides that are part of the pack. I just thought I'd give a quick background. Obviously, um, the council is very familiar with the water reform process um, as part of the uh, so we sign up to the memorandum of understanding. I'm required to provide a series of um, or a lot of information to the TIA um, around uh, various topics, uh, financial topics, water quality, number of customers, lots and lots of information. Um, and uh, we're taking a regional approach to responding to that RFI. Um, and Brian is the uh, project director for that project. Um, and I'll pass over to Brian to talk through the slides. 
Kia ora koutou. thank you um, for giving me a slot on your uh, council agenda. Um, so uh, as, as you know very well, um, the government has quite an ambitious um, reform agenda around uh, the delivery of digital services. So there's the reforms that are underway around work quality and the new regulator, um, but there is also the reform of the way that work services are delivered across the country, which is another piece of the, the reform um, puzzle. Um, and as the government's um, work on this is ramping up, the, the region that the, initially the shareholding councils of Wellington would have concluded that there's real value in working together on how we approach the water reform process. Um, and so this is both to make sure that um, we can respond in a really timely and effective way when the Department of Internal Affairs and the government um, ask things of us, but also um, to make sure that we're in a really good position to influence that reform process as it evolves over the coming year. It's going to be a very ambitious timeline, um, and so there's going to be some really critical conversations that um, this region and um, you as, as um, decision makers will want to uh, be part of. Um, and so we've, we're putting in place a, a regional um, project to, to work through this, um, and my role is to, I guess, make sure that um, Harry and his executive team and yourselves have really good information through that process that we all understand um, the decision points along the way. Um, we have an opportunity to um, make sure that you're you know, really well informed and that you can articulate your views into the right parts of that process um, as and when required. Um, and obviously the, the ultimate outcome of this work is to make sure that we get the best outcome for um, the people of, in the environment of this region around water reform. So, um, as you and said, one of the first cabs off the rank in this work over between now and the end of January is a request for information that Internal Affairs has issued, seeking a whole lot of data from um, each of the councils about their current uh, water assets, the way in which the water assets are managed, how they deliver services, information about customers, uh, and a whole lot of financial information. Now, the Wellington um, Water Shareholding Councils are in a, a good position to respond to this because Wellington Water has already collected uh, a large amount of this information. And so we're repurposing that information for the request for information process. But there is also some additional information that each council has to collect. And Katrina um, and Ewan are very much a part of pulling that together. That's a lot of that's customer data, financial data. It's a difficult time of year. There's a lot of other things going on. We're on a holiday, the holidays are coming up, but the deadline for this work is the 1st of February. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a busy time. There are some other pieces to this um, work that uh, we're starting to look at as well. And one of those is um, thinking about getting a better understanding of what some of the implications of the reform could be for councils. Um, and so we're starting to do some um, thinking about that um, and in the coming year, there's going to be a whole lot of pieces of work, and that's the green bubbles there. You know, this, these are really essentially mirroring the work that DIA has been underway. So DIA is already doing thinking about redesign of the water delivery system, what kind of entities might come into being, um, what the impacts could be on local government, the place of iwi Māori in all of this system, um, and of course, councils will be expected to um, have a view um, and to share their view into the processes at appropriate times. Um, and then, of course, depending on the outcome of the whole reform process and the decisions that councils make, is a transition piece that we'll, um, we'll have to work through later in the year, next year, where we start to see what the new structures look like um, and where your council will have made some decisions about how it wants to proceed um, in that context and, and you know, what we move to. Do we move to new entities? Um, which councils opt into those and all those kinds of things. So just in terms of some of the big milestones that are coming up over the course of the, um, the coming year, just wanted to touch on um, two or three of them on this slide. First one is end of February. We've obviously got um, the RFI. So beginning of February, we've got the RFI that we need to get in. That's that, all that data and information. Um, in March, we're expecting um, DIA to do a road show around the country where they will um, sort of make visible um, the key elements of 
of the water reform. So uh, that's where we would expect them to um, share with us, you know, how many entities do they think they might be looking at? Um, is it, you know, one for the whole country? Is it five? Is it 10? We, we just don't know the answer to that yet, and, and we will get visibility of that. And there'll be some other things that they're able to share with us at that point around the design of the system, um, whether it's whether it's two waters or three waters, um, perhaps some more detail around how those entities might relate to their customers. Um, and also, of course, um, probably more information about the process for councils to make decisions about um, opting in or, or not into this new reform process and what exactly that looks like. So there's a, you know, there'll be some important um, visibility for all of us about what the reform looks like by about March of next year. And then much later in the year, probably September, October, at this stage, that, that's kind of the timing is when um, it's envisaged um, councils might be wanting to have conversations with their communities and do a, some kind of engagement process uh, about how they want to uh, deal with the reform process. Again, that's, though that this timeline is DIA's timeline, it's not my timeline, and um, we're just wanting to get more visibility out of DIA and make sure that um, we're able to put really good information, timely information in front of CEs, councils, um, so that you're really well informed through the process. My final slide, short, short and sweet, um, happy to take some questions. My final slide is just to say that the way that we're kind of managing this project, um, because it is turning into a project with um, a range of pieces of work in it, is um, a little bit similar to the Wellington Regional Growth Framework, which I think you'll be familiar with. So um, essentially, we've got a working group, Ewan from your council sits on that working group. Um, I report up through to the um, CEs forum, um, and then we'll report on to the Merrill forum um, and this is to make sure that, you know, um, information sharing, I'm, I and the team are providing right information to CEs and to mayors at the right time. Um, in terms of iwi, the place of iwi in all of this, um, we're still working through exactly how we um, work with iwi on these, on these questions. One of the things to think through is that the water reforms are a central government reform process and DIA and central government are working and consulting with iwi throughout this process. And we just need to make sure that we're not at a regional level cutting across what is a national reform process, but at the same time, all of our councils in this region have relationships with Mana Whenua, and Mana Whenua are a critical partner in, um, in water reform. So we're just working through thinking about how um, Mana Whenua are best engaged in the regional um, response, I guess, to this national reform agenda. So I'm really happy to take some questions. Oh, we've got one. Brian with the one. <laughs> I just picked up on one thing. <clears throat> you said we were able to opt in or opt out of this. I so thought, so the current, sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, I just, my understanding of it was that we're going to have to opt in, like it or not. So the, the current, position, um, public position of um, DIA on this reform process is that there is a point at which councils make a decision whether to opt in or not into this process. Um, and so that's that's the official position. I think there's some, there is a question about um, how, how feasible it would be to remain outside of a national scale reform. So I think one of the reasons why that March roadshow will be really important for all of us as that will give us real visibility of you know, actually is it possible to opt in or opt out and if you chose not to be part of it would that really be a realistic yeah. option so I, I, the short answer is yeah. yeah good question need to wait and see Kia ora Brian uh, Brenda West um, how will non-performance of water companies be monitored Excellent question. <laughs> so my understanding is there'll be two regulators. There'll be um, there'll be the water quality regulator, which is Tonga for Arawai, which has just been established, and that will monitor, you know, the kind of um, water delivery quality. Is the water safe to drink? Um, is wastewater being properly managed? 
And then the other um, regulator is the economic regulator. So that's the regulator that makes sure that water companies don't run rogue and yeah. charge outrageous yeah. amounts of money or you know perform economically poorly. Yeah. Um, there'll still be the regulatory requirements around consenting um, and all of those remedies that exist. So there'll essentially be three ways in which you know water companies are regulated. I mean, just one other question. Um, the water companies that are going to be used to facilitate the delivery of our water services, will they be not for profit or will they be for profit? Current thinking is that they will be government owned and that they won't um, have to seek a dividend. So they'll effectively be not for profit. So, so does that mean that we could potentially yeah. be buying quality water? You know, so that um, I mean, very definitely the policy positions we can make up is. This is not about regeneration. So mm -hmm. it is um, literally because it changes the liquidity position. Yeah. Obviously, it's never going to have you ever went to that kind of place. So, yeah, so, but, but again, remember um, all of this stuff is being debated yeah, right now. Mm -hmm. so, there's, there, so there's no certainty that it works. So we're only seeing, as Brian says, how much, um, what, what, how all that advice and all those things um, are shaping up. And so, you know, even discussions about how the revenue will be generated, whether it's uh, volumetric charging, whether it's rate space, whether it's half consolidated. So, so this is a work in progress. So the critical thing here is uh, that we've got a process in the region um, to, to actually manage and keep oversight. There's so many moving parts to this. And so we need to make sure our views are in the mix. Um, and but equally, there's the national side as well, which we've got to keep an eye on as well. So even so, it's um, it's important that we are we are part of this discussion and active part of this. Discussion. Yeah, a couple of points. Couple, a couple of points. I mean, started off with saying it's an regional approach. Uh, I'm not quite clear how big the regions could be, particularly if we're looking at Iwi, um, because Iwi are, would be then split if we go to Hawke's Bay for ourselves, and I'm not quite sure whether the EV from the other coast would effectively have some involvement over here. That's one concern. Um, the other one is I see that for, if we actually do go to a regional approach going up to the wire, um, Manor 2, um, but one of the water is already at the table. So are there other alternatives at the table already to replace Wellington Water or are we stuck with it? So um, Wellington Water is participating in the, in the project as a, as an advisor, essentially. So Wellington, Wellington Water is not- Sorry, by advising you or us? Oh, us, 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 us all, us all, yeah. So they're our technical advisors in this, but they are not, and they are not part, they, they won't be part of all of the um, meetings and all of the discussions, because as, as I think is sitting in your, your question, um, they are the current way in which this group of councils choose to deliver their water services. They're not necessarily um, the way in which you know we will deliver water services when we have a, you know, a water company. They, so, so, so Wellington Water is a is the current um, way that this that this group of councils choose to deliver water services. But if your region went to to Manawatu, yes, they have their own water. We start again. Um, so, so coming to your first, the first. <clears> thing, um, Comment which about sort of the scale of the yeah, first the point. Um, so in the first instance, we're, walk, we're working together um, as Wellington Water Shareholding Councils, but actually after this meeting, I'm going to meet with both um, Carterton and Masterton to talk to them about whether they would like to join in this project in terms of how we interact with the reform process. And I'm also doing the same with Carpet. So whether so we, we have a sort of Wellington region project. Um, in terms of how we interact with the water reform process. But I don't think we should make any assumptions about what the <coughs> aggregation might look like. Um, it's quite likely it'll be a much bigger aggregation than either what is currently Wellington Water or does the, the Wellington region. It's, it's likely to be you know, a much larger aggregation, bringing in you know, a whole other region into a water region. And that's a discussion yet to be held. There's a lot of work, as I understand it, going on inside DIA, but that discussion hasn't been built with the yeah. stakeholders. I think if you go back to the conversation we had uh, during the Shed Commission Council meeting, 
um, when, when we had some presentations on that. That's, that's what we're guided by that. Yeah. 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 yeah, so the, the initial um, public information DIA shared with them was even talking about the uh, tranche one, was they were, um, you know, conceptually they looked like uh, they wanted to have populations of the order of 1.5 million. Yeah, so because their argument is about efficient investment is around an economy of scale. So you know they're basically talking about um, you know, base design, which is around a large metropolitan area, uh, but that would capture up to a catchment size, sorry, uh, you know, people catchment size about 1.5 million. So they're talking scale. And that's right. so when, when it's confusing to talk of the term region, because they're not thinking. Uh, the, you know, the, the current regions as we know them, which are based on watersheds. You know? So um, the, 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 the design is, a, and there is a cluster of you know, like the uh, and we the government to work out the principles around what the, the size, shape, materiality, reach um, is, but it, it has to be informed also by the RFI information as well. So just to just carry on there, the, so the, the, my other concern is in terms of the assets, the water assets, and the privatisation potentially. Do we have any protection for that, or do we are obliged, in the way it's going now, that our assets will have to transfer to the aggregating aggregation organisations? Well, we're waiting. Um, we're waiting to see the, exactly what the system and the entity looks like when um, we get more visibility of that in March. Um, but. Currently, one of the base principles of the reform is that, they, that, that they would be pub, these would be publicly owned um, companies. And the government, as I understand it, is very focused on ensuring that it's, you know, that they, this isn't a pathway to privatisation. So um, one of the ways that that could be assisted is, for example, by councils continuing to be, you know, shareholders of these wood companies, um, the owners of the wood companies. Yeah, so there's a, lot, there's a lot unknown at the moment. Yeah, there's a lot unknown. And, and, and all the questions you're asking are questions that are, that, that are in the mix. And um, they're all questions that are, you know, that all councils are asking themselves. Councillor Hay. So um, I've got concerns about potential privatisation down the, down the track. So if I think about the electricity companies as a good example. Um, in your view, is there anything in that could be put into legislation that would safeguard that future, that it wouldn't be subject to prime citation in the future? Do you think there's any harm? You can never bind future governments. You know, that's not happening. You know, so if the governments, the future government can, of course, make that choice. Um, I guess all we can do at this stage is firstly, this region can articulate that concern into the reform process and say that's a really critical <coughs> bottom line for, for the councils in this region, or your council can say that into the process. Um, but also, um, you know, currently the way that um, the reform process is described and the principles that are informing it is that it's not about privatisation. So, so the government has made a very clear intent yeah. to put the assets in public ownership. Yeah. So it would have shined there. But essentially, what Brian is saying that even though they have a law today, oh, exactly. and say so there's no and mm -hmm. the legislative framework allows governments to change and may, um, change their minds essentially and, and change legal frameworks at their own behest. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's part of the democratic yes. society. So yeah. you can't mm -hmm. write a piece of legislation that binds future governments. No, no, no. no. In, the no. Way, in the same way that um, councils in the past have chosen to do the same thing, you know. Yeah. Um, there are councils around the country that chose to privatize, have chosen to privatise assets um, in the past. But I, I, there's nothing about this reform um, that suggests it's about wanting to do anything other than keep these assets in public ownership. Yeah, With the knowledge we've got today, which sure. may not be the same. Yeah. So if you think about the significant underfunding that we've got right throughout the country, if, for example, it was privatised, they could companies could be planned for their opex and capex in Australia successfully. Um, is that something that's been thought about and discussed? So, do I answer that in a different way? Yeah. Um, so, so it is not necessary for a pre-privatised for um, a company to act as a company. Right? Mm -hmm. So you have a public, public corporation, public company that owns assets. That can actually um, use those assets as we do 
to run its balance sheet. Oh, it, there's no, it's not necessary to achieve that by privatisation. So this is very much exactly what the government is doing. They're going to set up essentially more corporations, more companies with an asset base so that they can actually uh, then make decisions. So the fundamental um, issue with Wellington Water is uh, not Wellington Water, but it's the decision that councils have made that did, did, did not put Wellington Water to manage to uh, have the assets, unlike water care, which does. So, uh, so it's part of it. I mean, there's been a great yeah. I have certain opinions which we can share over time. Uh, but there's more than one way to, to approach this. It'd be interesting to see what we are, um, you know, what comes out of the, the discussions that have been had at the moment. Yeah. Can I ask a question? My, my concern would be around the entity size of. If they're going to base it, for example, on a population of 1.5 million. When you've got a small area like us, which has got the 10,000 people, how do you have the same voice or, or don't get overlocked in a larger entity so that things go to a metropolitan area rather than come to, to rural? I think yeah. that's a real big concern. I think that's a really critical question. Um, I met DIA, someone from DIA last week, and one of the questions I asked was that very question, which was, you know, what thinking are you doing about how, you know, large multi-regional, we would think of as multi-regional entities, how will they ensure that they um, hear the community's voice? Um, how will they ensure that they have strong <coughs> prioritization processes? Um, that, those are all things that they are working on. I mean, there are mechanisms that have been developed in Scotland and Tasmania and other places that have these kinds of companies that operate on these kinds of scales and they do have ways to make sure that, you know, all the parts of their regions that they're responsible for um, get an opportunity to be part of the prioritisation process um, at the force. So I think critical question and one that we <coughs> want to keep an eye on as a region as this draws out. So I'm going to just add, add to that, I'm going to come back to the role of the regulator. Um, so, yeah. so, so this is not a um, who, who shouts the loudest gets the investment kind of thing. So the, um, the, you have the, um, you know, the, the, the water supply, wastewater regulator that will set standards. And so that will dictate the level of investment that's required. And that's neutral. You know, there's not a choice whether uh, to say, okay, we'll do this council first or this council last. Uh, everyone has to, uh, to meet the standards. And the second is the economic regulation. The, you know, the most um, analogous sort of example is the electricity industry, the, the old uh, electricity commission. And that's to look past the consumer interests. Um, so the economic regulation is very much tied up with making sure that the pricing um, and the consumer interests are there. So, you well, I'm not, you're not sure there's much faith in that. I think having said so, I'm quite in the about the voice of the small versus the big, and actually how the standards and how the regulation occurs creates a natural form of equalisation, which is really important. So, it's very important not just to focus where these things are going, it's to have a look at the whole system, which is your point, Pam, how it fits together. So, our consumer interests, our rate power interests, <coughs> one, there's the council role. But then there's also other regulators going to do their job, and I'll be confident they will do their job. Absolutely, because I see that um, yes, everyone may have to have the same drinking water, for example. Everyone has to have the same standards for that. But you, you can see that the metropolitan, where there's a larger quantity of people, are going to get their action first rather than the rural, because there's less less people. <coughs> do it and I just see that there's some initial piece in there. Um, uh, you've got, I, I may have my opinion, it's known in regard to the time frame, but given how many unknowns there are and looking at DIA's project milestones, how achievable is it? Yeah. That's a question probably to direct <laughs> to them. Um, I think it, uh, what I would say is it's a very ambitious time frame. Mm. Um, I think they're very conscious of um, you know of, of the desire of the new government to 
really make progress on this issue. Um, it's, it's really ambitious. Yeah. But equally contrast that um, with uh, the Prime Minister's own agenda for the elite this particular period, which is focusing on delivery. Yeah, yeah it's process. Yeah, Alistair. Yeah, just my, my question sort of follows on a little bit from Pam's. Um, who's going to dictate how much water has got? Because we know right now that the amount of water that we use in South Wyapa per head is significantly bigger than what Auckland does, for example. Is this going to be balanced out, or are councils still going to say, no, our district wants X cubic litres per person? Or is it going to be, is this a means by reducing the amount of water that gets used? Who decides? I guess I, you know, I guess we'll have these new. Let's assume that we will opt in. So we'll have these new water companies that that are responsible for managing um, supply, um, managing. You know, they'll probably want to do some demand management as well as part of the way in which they they manage their their business. Um, and you know, as Harry said, there'll be demand um, from the, the various regulators. And there'll be um, the consenting requirements they have around water take and all that sort of stuff. So I don't, I don't think I can give you an answer to that specific question. Um, I think you know. I think I, I, I think Brian Asia did answer the question. <laughs> Essentially, what it means is that the the type of policies that we would set uh, that we would traditionally set for um, um, users, such as how much water is free, um, how much weight is, and all that type of stuff. That policy setting would shift to the to actually put in place. Okay, so how will how will our rate payers who are obviously paying for that because we're going to pay through the rates for somewhere or another going to have a say as to say you know South Wyapa might say actually we want more water than that because we have an abundance of supply. Those those uh, policies um, will, will sit with the entity. Okay. Yeah. It won't sit with both. It won't be like a function. That's the answer. Right. Yeah. So yeah. we will put the right. We will test the public water question and how they can solve it. No longer be a water delivery and water services will no longer be something that the council um, is in the Okay, so well, because it, my quick man, and obviously this needs to be go back in there, how will the user, i.e., like the person that lives in the town, Get that feedback and say we want actually more water in our in our town. To be determined. Yeah. Okay, so that was that's one long enough because we can't answer. Yeah. Yeah. I know these things are being worked through. You know, that's yeah. 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 all these questions are exactly the same ones that I mean, there's six, uh, 67 entities of local government that are asking all these questions. Yeah. And it's part of our advice, the level of service around this. It's also being pulled together and yeah. yeah. my, my second question following off of that then is a pricing thing. Is this is this going to become a means by which water is priced? Across the country, so I can, again, price? I can answer. I heard um, um, it was Dance, but I heard uh, what's his name, Alan. Uh, Alan, they said because because of the, the concern from local government is that this is a means of actually commodifying water. It's a price on water. So he was very quick to say this is about the price of supply, not putting a price on water per se. Mm -hmm. Dance around the head of the pen as much as you like, but that's, that's <laughs> the official answer. Yeah. Well, that's no different from what we've got now. We've got, uh, that's exactly right. We've all got yeah. hundreds of questions, oh, no. very few of them can be answered. I don't know. Yeah. Can't, not, I suppose yeah. that what this gives is a little bit bigger queue, so you can feed these questions in. Exactly. And yeah. they're, they're, they're questions that are, there's consistency about these kind of concerns. Yeah. So we're not, we're not out there on the field from South Wales. No. But you're going to cut more of this during the road shows. Well, it's not my road show. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be listening. I'll be listening to the IA copying it. I'll be listening to the IA Just coming back to the patent. So what, 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 what we're saying here is um, there is an IRA copying process. The first step on the journey as a region, um, and it started with the, um, the Wellington Board shareholders. Um, we're starting now a wider journey to say, does the whole region want to be connected so that we're actually making we have coherent analysis, coherent feedback, um, and I could not support that more because the worst case scenario is this, um, the DIA receives some different views about what this does. Yeah. So the, the bigger and more agreed, and doesn't mean you have, all have to have consensus, there'll be some things we may agree to disagree with, 
but in terms of if you want to um, influence and inform the public debate, the more, the less voices, but more consistent voices are better. So I fully support that. This obviously is your governor's decision. Um, but um, just want to leave it like that. You know, on Friday, we will be discussing this at the general forum um, with regards to the a, 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 a joining together for a cohesive voice on what we want to see out there. Very good. If we have the council, should we be collating somewhere all these questions to make sure that as we go through, um, they, some of those questions don't get overlooked, that we actually do get, yep. as we think of them, then, then that's on that list. So so that the, to be fair, all those questions are being replicated by every council in New Zealand and, uh, and more. So probably it's another question to be asked, but I think in February you'll see a lot more coming out with the shape of what true questions are. And I think that's the, yeah, so right now the questions are this big. Yeah. Um, I think let's, let's get to a certain point where, where we, we know we've got more certainty about what this is really going to be right now. And then we'll nail those questions. And, we, and we want to we'll be workshopping and get some really good yeah. information questions out there. Yeah, that's cool. But in workshop, I mean, that's, uh, we're having a workshop with the council and going, Better and bigger to consolidate those questions, or um, yeah. I mean, let's 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 at the moment until we know the information, it's pretty hard to work out. Yeah. And that's what we get. But our point at comp that is being indicated in the timeline, the consultation is with the public on what is proposed, mm. um, as opposed to what it should look like, and that's around March. Mm. So there'll be a roadshow. With the kind of high, as I understand, there'll be a roadshow in March from DIA saying these are the kind of high level decisions that have been made around what you know around some of the key parameters of the reform, and then the, the the kind of public consultation process is intended to be sort of later in the year, um, and I guess one of the things that we'll get more visibility of in March is. What exactly would the conversation with the public be? Because there'll be some things that actually are givens, yeah. and there'll be some things where there may be a genuine you know, um, conversation with the community about what they what they do and don't. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this one, and just on that, the uh, consultation with the public will be after legislation is introduced. So it's not really a consultation. No, it's not a consultation. No, it's not a consultation. No, it's not a consultation. Um, yes. Again, uh, Brian, uh, so um, the, the intent is uh, slightly different to this time of table here, but it's not going far off. So what they intend to do is uh, march, is essentially say, this is all we're shaping up. This is the way it's looking. Yeah, that's not decisions. Um, and uh, all these are the givens and these aren't. You know, to give, give, give us more certainty. Um, then is to get the feedback there and then they're going to take it to cabinet. Cabinet will sign off and confirm what government's policy is based on having had that round of discussion, right? But so that happens. Then their intention that they, uh, they explained to me, which is not appeared with Brian, was in July, August, they would then go out um, with a uh, full, that's the full pre-consultation uh, entering into um, the legislative agenda, which is around September, August. Come um, September to December. So we need to clarify. Yeah, we do. I, mean, I, I, I heard that literally on, on one of the political parties around this last week. Cool. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's an advance on yeah. uh, two weeks ago. So this is a moving piece. Yeah. Uh, Give us something out. Um, uh, just, just really, really quickly, I, I just, I guess uh, it is moving fast, but I just wonder um, what the thinking is that. Uh, um, the AWI comes in in March <laughs> um, next year. Um, so uh, uh, when you take the roadshow out for local government and AWI? Um, um, the roadshow is, um, the roadshow is not our roadshow. It's, you know, I, I work for you. So the yeah. roadshow is DIA's roadshow. Right. Um, and, and DIA is already, as I understand, DIA is already doing EWI engagement. They've oh, okay. had a round of consultation throughout the, this year. They've been talking with EWI. Okay. Um, and there'll be more, obviously, um, in the coming year. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, mm. yeah, we're more com uh, yeah. comfortable, but we informed more slightly. We'll also continue to keep your details. Yeah, that's what it is.
But thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks for <laughs> We're now moving on to D2, our representative report, D2, the action items report. We have a move to the Thank you very much, Councillor Sigam, Councillor Maynard. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, the motion is carried. So, Councillors, any questions you want to ask for officers based on the action item? Oh, hi, this is just this is just a quick one. This is a Karen question. Um, item two hundred and three. <clears throat> I just wonder if we could somehow reword old scalable car because if you recall, it caused quite a lot of um, anxiety in the community. And I wonder if we could have a bracket saying. It's the terror junction area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other questions? I agree. Satisfying the sound three open lines. Well, actually, I was going to comment, comment that yeah. um, Action 20 develop a policy for person tracking with, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. 440 <coughs> line. Yep. That's actually um, action as well. So remember, that was the discussion about before we go out of consultation. And we yeah. Yeah. So I apologise, that should have been reported as an action item. Okay. Uh, okay. <coughs> this is the smallest I've ever seen the action. Ah, but there is a reason for that. Yes. A lot of the actions have gone into the committee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not done, they just moved. Ah. Yeah. Well, but it's still oh, no. pretty good. I'm sorry, but you know, credit with credit, it's pretty good. Yeah, oh, just my from the my I have a quest on there about the withdrawal of the uh, 2017 application from uh, the minutes of the 516. 14. Yeah, right. I couldn't see the action. Yeah, yeah which one was that for? Well, I was number you. I was drawn over to the to get the slice for a We remember um, um, that question was asked of assets and services. Yeah. yeah, Bond explained why. Okay. Yeah. What was the explanation? Mm -hmm. Um, that, that the Grand uh, Rapids Regional Council would not withdraw the consent until another consent is applied for. That's right. No, that's, no, that's, that's not correct. That's not correct. Right. So we have it in writing for that. It's not correct. Okay, okay. that's so, the website. Oh, so I asked again. What, what the name and I was to who had not withdrawn it. <coughs> that is not the answer. Go on. No, that's my answer. Could I, could so, I ask a question? It's sort of one? not quite related to this, but it's sort of. Um, and it's about. Sorry, Gary, can you have this? Sorry. So, so that's what the common game was around. Um, the developers wanted to see a plan and a timeline for the application before they would accept the withdrawal of the 2017 application. And they've received that? Yeah. They've received a letter from us. Yep. And it's been withdrawn? I would have to check about something we've done. Before. No, it hasn't been withdrawn. And I have a note from regional council saying it's important to note, therefore, that the on hold application of 20 Pearl. Um, allows the application to con applicant to continue operating. So we don't need 2017. This is the argument we've been having for months. I would really like clarification from somebody as to why it has not been withdrawn. Okay. So we've submitted a letter to Greater Wellington to withdraw that consent application. All of Greater Wellington is supported where that is. Can they report back to assets and services on that? Yep. No, I'm reporting back to council. I've been waiting four weeks for an answer of why it has not been withdrawn. Well, I think you just had a report that it has been requested to be withdrawn and it sits with the regional council. Um, you've been waiting for eight months for this. Yeah, but the advice from the regional council, sorry, from the reporters, the reason why is that uh, the, uh, the Greater Rose Regional Council is not willing to accept our request for a report until they have seen solid progress that we intend to um, put in place um, and apply for a new consent. And so, so we make the offer, 
they haven't accepted it. This is not what they say when they actually put the application through. And we've been sitting here arguing about this since March. Uh, the question I gave to you, you was, please, can you tell us, did we drop the ball in March or did we not apply? I know we did not apply as at the 2nd of October. Nothing had happened. And I'm still asking a reasonable question. Did we drop the ball or did Wellington Water drop the ball? And who had the onus to apply to withdraw the 2017 consent? So, so the date of the letter that went to the Greater Realm was the 7th of October. I don't know where that lack of action happened. I can look into it if, it, if that's the big issue. But the, the letter has been sent to Greater Realm. And that was from the council, not from Wellington Water? That was from us, I say. So why did it take so long? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I can look into it if that's, if that's the issue. Well, I'm concerned because it means that every time we ask something to happen, then seven months later, we check up and find it has not happened. Now, everybody at this table knew we moved to withdraw on the 18th. Did so everybody know it has not happened? So when we, uh, when we made that, was uh, did that have to come from the council? I, I'm sorry, I just want to get this really clear in my mind. <coughs> or was it Wellington Water that was meant to That's put that forward? No, that so it needed to come from the council. Clara, Clara, I'm not sure, but we moved in March. We resolved to yep. withdraw. So withdraw it. It would be nice to see a timeline, perhaps, of what happened between then and 29th of October when we signed the letter. I think what we need is more pertinent is absolute confirmation either from council, either from either from Greater Wellington Regional Council, that the application has been solidly withdrawn. Well, that's part of it, but also I the point that the process yeah. between resolution and actual, yeah. whether or not yeah. that is an acceptable, or there's justification for that type of time, that it would be marvellous to have, because it, 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 it's, a, it's a process that we need to firm up if there was no reason, doubt of reason. I'm very happy to supply documentation, and I've got letters from Wellington Regional Council saying we have not applied, um, and all the rest of it. <coughs> it's so embarrassing that I go and talk to locals who say, have you withdrawn it? And I say, yes. And you told me you did. Yeah. It's very frustrating. I'm sorry. So if we could have an action item and a timeline of what happened between resolution and withdrawal, and confirmation that it has been withdrawn. Perfect. Cool. Right. Any other questions? Could I, could I ask a question? And it's to do with the water races. Um, and I know it's been closed, but I, and it only came to light because I rang up Pope and Gray to say, can you come and clean the water race? My, uh, my part of it. And they said, oh, we don't do it anymore. It's Wellington Water's property. Correct. I don't know whether any farmer has been advised about who they should contact in terms of actually doing the work. Sorry? Waterists and breakers have received letters advising all of that change. Okay, well, that's really good. But um, so the water and the water race goes through my property and I'm not part of the scheme. <laughs> so. Um, I don't know who to go to, and I rang Paper Gray, and they said, "Oh, we don't deal with this anymore." So uh, I'm sure that I'm just one of many people who have water race water going through an existing creek line. Wants to obviously do their part, but so we need to. Yeah. Otherwise, we can have blockages all over the place. Can you just um, make a comment around that? Maybe that's something for a comms enemy that regular. In addition, possibly, because we certainly need to make sure that people who are affected have these couple. Oh, you can tell us when you get any other questions on the <laughs> All right, all good. Yeah. Oh. Right, moving also, on. Right, just one question regarding um, the liquor license, the district licensing committee. Um, We've shortlisted two, um, two people. Um, and so I, would, I have a question over uh, the availability in terms of their time commitment. They've got very busy people in terms of what they do. Um, and so I'm uh, just meeting for the I'll ask for it to meet with them. So I'll just ask that question because it waits for me to wait another two weeks before I get five minutes on my calendar to meet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but they're very high right. caliber applicants um, and, and take all the boxes in terms of that criteria and what we want to do. Experience. Right. 
So moving on now to the one from Mayor's report. Um, I apologise, we had a bit of a mix-up where I was uh, thought I'd sent it to the approval, but before Suzanne hadn't actually received the amended approval for um, distribution of its SAT. So it is now within Stella. Uh, if you refresh your Stella, it was done this morning. Um, we do. So I can talk to it or we can um, table it now. And we can go out of it. So. How do we know which version we're looking at? Well, I'll refresh your one that you're in there. Oh, okay. Are you serious? Yeah, there it is. So, so, it's it's in the same way so you can go out of there. You if you just refresh and then go out of there. Mine hasn't. Mine hasn't. It's all right. Yeah, it's all right. Which you were in the same place. I have to do it. Who's since gone on to the board of ETI? Yeah. Um, uh, we thoroughly, have, uh, Alistair and I have been involved in this. We agree with the concept. Uh, however, we will be doing this within the council mm -hmm. as opposed to employing ETI uh, to deliver on the employer liaison program, uh, which was a bonus initially, but both of us and ourselves felt that that was the correct way to go. Um, but just letting you know that a 5 FTE for our community liaison, community support officer, has been employed on the staff of the family to work with uh, the task force and jobs employer liaison. Nice. Uh, Wellington Water Committee, um, as I mentioned already, um, there was a, uh, an issue at Wellington Water Committee regarding um, requesting a full internal review of Wellington Water given the qualified audit. Um, since the results of the audit worked out, that was voted down, um, request by Wayne Guppy. Um, however, we are, as I've mentioned, moving to look at the mural form outside of the Wellington Water Committee on the um, proposed RF3 audit reforms. Uh, coming up is the Tuya program, which is where the mayor mentors a young uh, Renatahi uh, for the district. And I would like any suggestions of anyone who may feel may benefit within the South Island. I think we spend $3,000 a year on this. Um, and apparently it is for the people who have participated life changing. Uh, so if you could, we're looking at selection in February, but if you have any suggestions, please forward them to me or to the council website. Uh, and then the old task force for jobs, I'll probably let Alistair uh, provide a verbal update, but there is a report we've appended to the back of this mural report. Uh, we report back to mural task force for jobs on successes, <coughs> and that is an appendix. <laughs> With regards to that, how, how are we tracking against other councils? Does it show that? And, and no, I'm waiting to hear back. Mm. And we don't get, we are moving into, into Zoom groups where we can discuss ideas and how to refine them. We're currently running, um, we have a target of 25 uh, employment for our first tranche of funding. Uh, we're currently at 24, we're probably at 25 now. Uh, so we can apply for another tranche of funding. 
though um, some councils were one or two, uh, or some councils at 86. Nice. You know, so it really depends on the demographics of the need. Sometimes we're struggling. You know, I think the youth numbers uh, of youth unemployment in South Wales are relatively low. So, so, so when you say youth, what age range? Um, 18 to 26. 20, 18 to 26, but we've extended it to 16 yeah. to catch the people who fall between leaving school early and being eligible for domestic or adult. Oh. Okay, so um, since our since our last meeting, um, uh, Alan Maxwell, um, we said last time was retiring, um, so uh, there has been a replacement appointed. I can't remember his name. Yeah. Lockie. Lockie. Yeah. So his background is he was a police, he was a sworn police officer, then he retired from that and he moved into um, the Salvation Army as an ordained minister. Uh, which he did for a number of years, and now he's pulled out, he's finished that engagement, and he's back doing some contract work with police, but he wanted to get back into the social work thing. Um, so he's right in the space. He'd be, he's going to be actually ex excellent, I think. Um, so he takes over on the 4th of December. Um, um, since the last council meeting, um, Alex and I met with uh, Potomokai down at the old golf course, where we um, had a good chat to them about um, the progression of how we could uh, grow the, uh, the whole concept of planting teams and, um, because there's lots of contracts coming up with the, the tree planting and the um, pest management, fencing, so on and so forth. Um, so what we're looking at is trying to develop a course <coughs> based on a pilot program that's been run by Greater Wellington and Dock, transferring that to a training establishment so we can access some Department of Education money so we can then get youth trained up as whole teams ready to go. Alex is working on the contractual side of getting the contracts from Greater Wellington and the various organisations that dock and so on. I'm working on with Greater Wellington on the training side about how we can transition their, their pilot program into a, um, a, a service provider that can do the training. Uh, and um, Barbara Trust is looking at their capability to take on these people and supply the people for training so that they're going to be up and running. Eventually, when Potomokai grows their capability at their own speed, um, those contracts would then be moved to them so that they would have not only the growing of the plants, but also the operational arm of planting or fencing or pest control and so on. So they're getting the income from that, which will then help fund the, the growing side. Um, Thanks. Maybe. So yeah, there's a lot, a lot of little moving parts going on there. Um, the other training area we're looking at is road traffic management. We know there's a huge call for road traffic management people in the Warrapa, COVID grading, for example, nine. <coughs> Higgins needs heaps as well. So we're going to be looking at running our own um, specific South Warrapa uh, uh, road traffic management. We're just sending our first two on to Wellington to get their ticket, which we're funding. A um, couple of 18. <coughs> So who's not fully there? Um, oh, they'll, no. go, they'll go straight to Pope and Grove. Pope and Grove said they'll take they'll take up yeah, making sure there's a demand yeah. prior to sending them yeah. off. So, right. so these these right. these young ones will have jobs literally as soon as yeah, they yeah. So they'll also not only will they do the uh, traffic management, they'll get site safe, they'll get first aid, they'll get um, fully equipped with their PPE. So they're ready to start literally the day they go back and get off the course. You could tell people because we we use people from over the hill for our training. Yeah. Yeah. Just on the Alistair, um at the <clears throat> local community fire meeting the other night, if they are called to a fire on the road, they are not allowed to stop traffic until they've done a course. Yep. So I think there's an opportunity for the local fire brigade to come to this course. <clears throat> at the moment, the fire chief for the, this area said to him, if you want to stop traffic, all you do is park the fire engine across the road and move away. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll work on stop it going. So but you know, having um to the to Jamari uh Lake Ferry. Uh, we, yeah, I'll speak to Alan, and if we're running it, we could be put it out of invitation. Yeah. 
and then the last that we just uh, this week we've had our uh, monthly uh, six monthly governance meeting of the project um, where we, we uh, where we talk about a higher level of what's going on. Uh, Kurunui are uh, pretty much set to take over the, the license training um, as of next term um, February, so that'll be really good. Um, so we'll have so no children or no youth should leave Kurunui without a restricted license, um, and if need be, we'll. Uh, increase the capability there. Um, so I think he's pretty pretty onto it. Um, in terms of uh, the other job areas, uh, there's lots of there's lots of little bits moving, and people are starting to um, starting to nominate some you know sort of um, highlight people that are available. We've got a very good pipeline now from Kurunui, so we know that no one no one is going to be able to leave Kurunui unless they're a, um, if they're not in training or they have got a job, we will know about it and straight away they'll be picked up on um, making sure that they don't get into that realm of sitting idle for a while because it becomes infectious. So we're going to make sure that they're, they're picked up straight away, which is really good. So, uh, cool. Thanks, Alison. Um, and on top of that, you'll see an appendix to the end of that. Uh, my, my, I did a data dump thinking that I was just going to publish my diary and report to Sam one by one. If, Typed it up, so I won't do that to you again. <laughs> I didn't think she was going to do that. Um, but it's been a busy month and it's getting busier. Mm. In all perspective, there's a lot of stuff on it that you can be well two times this week uh, just because of meetings, transport meetings. Yeah. Well, with regard to the Ellen and Maxwell replacement, is there an opportunity to actually? Yes, we've yeah. asked you to, and we've asked you to get committee meetings as well. Oh, and the yes, board. yes, so, yes. So once, once he's on board, uh, yeah, he'll be able to tell him to introduce. Oh, yeah. Can you um, pick up the other bits that Ellen's dropped? Oh, there's another person. Oh, no, there'll be the actual person who will be involved in that contract. And they also have uh, courses, and they've rented part of the information, this information center to drop it. Um, so that they actually have an office for people who can't see them twice. Are you are you, are you talking about Gary? Are you talking about the other stuff that he does with Kurunui? Yeah. Um, my understanding is that's part of the employment that he's got because Farnham Trust is providing that facility for Kurunui. Is that right? Yeah, that's not yeah, but, but also because he's also got the the, back, the faith background as well. Yeah. That opens up other areas within the community. Right. Um, so, um, obviously, we're taking um, what you've just seen Bill into a bit of a at this moment. I think we will eventually. At the moment, we are running along very briskly and we're seeing the results we've got. We haven't seen the need to, you know, there's actually only so many we can do, and the only types of you don't want, that are not equipped to look at long term. Virtual unemployed people there are still uh, running nicely. Uh, eventually, we will have comms, we are getting comms from your town sources for jobs. Um, I think we'd like to see some of the big projects that we're playing on come to fruition. But we will all be making that. Um, and just one other thing. Um, Alison, you mentioned that you don't think um, there may be, but it's a, it's the first time it's been trialled by late LGNZ. Uh, it's already been hailed as a look what we can do if we give it some money. Yeah. Uh, and um, we'll just have to look at whether it's extended next year and whether the scope might be extended, in which case they would really need to make a more cast. I think it's, it's really important to note with this project that uh, it doesn't take anything away from what MSD does. MSD is <laughs> Hugely supportive of what we're doing and also providing um, names of young people that could be involved. Um, the, the single biggest thing that we have that supports us is a lack of bureaucracy. And I know you all know that I'm a big fan of bureaucracy. And I think it's important. <laughs> um, but in this case, it actually works to the benefit of us because there are no rules and we make them up as we go along. Uh, much to the um, disquiet of some of the staff in the council. Don't <laughs> 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 Right, so we've got a win. Yeah, I need to leave. I'm all okay with Mia's report, which I'm looking forward to.
Okay, um, Alice, now everyone's got it, we'll move to receive the news report. Thank you. Executive Council. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those against, motion is carried. So now we move on to a motion to go to the public excluded. The full motion and reason is presented in the agenda papers. Can I have a councillor move that we enter into the exclusion? Thank you, Councillor Phillips. You can do it. Councillor West, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those against. Motion is carried. Please wait for the room to clear. <laughs> <laughs> Oh and, and don't quote my love of bureaucracy. That was the one we were waiting for. Don't mention the fire. I'm going to tell you about the family of the community. Uh, and the community funding agency funded a group at the Business Board of Bobby Town in the Bobby Town Bank. Uh, and it's framed to be young people. Um, and so we have been asking for that. Therefore, we've trained from employees of the Bobby Town Bank.